The Ten Commandments Life application of the Ten Commandments with additional chapters on sin, salvation, prayer, and more. Updated edition. Written by Thomas Watson. Narrated by Scython Williams. The Law and Sin Man's Inability to Keep the Moral Law Is anyone able to keep the commandments of God perfectly? No. No mere human since the fall is able to perfectly keep the commandments of God in this life, but he daily breaks them in thought, word, and deed. We all stumble in many ways. James 3, 2 Man, in his original state of innocence, was endowed with the ability to keep the whole moral law. He had uprightness of mind, sanctity of will, and perfection of power. He had the copy of God's law written on his heart. No sooner did God command than he obeyed. As the master key fits all the locks and can open them, so Adam had a power suited to all God's commands, and he could obey them. Adam's obedience ran parallel with the moral law, just as a well-made sundial goes exactly with the sun. Man, in his innocence, was like a well-tuned organ. He was sweetly in tune to the will of God. He was adorned with holiness as the elect angels, but was not confirmed in holiness as the angels. He was holy, but susceptible to change. He fell from his purity, and we fell with him. Sin cut the lock of original righteousness where our strength lay. It brought a lifelessness and weakness into our souls. It has so weakened us that we will never recover our full strength until we put on immortality. I now intend to demonstrate that we cannot give perfect obedience to the moral law. An unregenerate person cannot perfectly obey all God's commands. He can just as well touch the stars or walk across the ocean as to yield exact obedience to the law. An unregenerate person cannot act spiritually. He cannot pray in the Holy Spirit. He cannot live by faith, and he cannot act out of love of duty to God. And if he cannot do duty spiritually, much less can he do it perfectly. It is clear that a natural man cannot yield perfect obedience to the moral law. One. An unsaved person cannot perfectly obey all God's commandments because he is spiritually dead. God has made you alive, you who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 1. How can someone, being dead, keep the commandments of God perfectly? A dead person is not fit for action. A sinner has the symptoms of death upon him, he has no awareness. He has no sense of the evil of sin, of God's holiness and truth. Therefore, he is said to be without feeling, or having become callous. Ephesians 4 19. An unsaved person has no strength. Romans 5 6. What strength does a dead person have? An unregenerate person has no strength to deny himself or to resist temptation. He is dead and a dead person cannot fulfill the moral law. 2. An unsaved person cannot perfectly keep all God's commandments because he is born in sin and lives in sin. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, 5. He drinks iniquity like water. Job 15, 16. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6, 5. The least evil thought is a breaking of God's law, and if there is any flaw, there cannot be perfection. As an unsaved person has no power to keep the moral law, so he has no will to do so. He is not only dead, but he is worse than dead. A dead person does no harm but there is a life of resistance against God that accompanies the death of sin. 
A natural or unsaved person not only cannot keep the law because of his weakness, but he breaks it through willfulness. We will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven. Jeremiah 44, 17. A regenerate or saved person cannot keep the moral law perfectly. There is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Ecclesiastes 7.20. Even in the best actions of a godly person is that which is damnable if God would weigh him in the balance of justice. How his duties are contaminated! He cannot pray without wondering, nor believe without doubting. The willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Romans 7.18. Paul, though a saint of the first magnitude, was better at willing than at doing. Mary asked where they had laid Jesus, John 20.13, for she had a mind to have carried him away, but she lacked strength. In the same way, the saved have a desire to obey God's law perfectly, but they lack strength. Their obedience is weak and feeble. The target at which they are to aim is perfection of holiness, but even though they aim properly and do what they can, they miss the target. A Christian, while serving God, is like the rower who rows hard but is hindered, for a gust of wind carries him back again. That is why Paul says, The good that I want I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Romans 7 19. I am driven back by a temptation. If there is any failure in a person's obedience, he cannot be a perfect expression of God's law. The Virgin Mary's obedience was not perfect. She needed Christ's blood to wash her tears. Aaron had to make atonement for the altar to show that even the most holy offering has defilement in it and needs atonement to be made for it. Exodus 29, 37. If a person has no power to keep the whole moral law, why does God require him to do so? Is this justice? Although man has lost his power to obey, God has not lost his right to command. If a master entrusts a servant with money, and the servant spends it on sin, may not the master justly demand it? God gave us power to keep the moral law, which we lost by messing with sin. But cannot God still call for perfect obedience and justly punish us if we fail to meet His standard? Why does God allow such an inability in us so that we cannot keep the law? God allows this inability in us in order to humble us. Man is a self exalting creature, and if he has or does anything at all of worth, he is ready to be proud and boastful. However, when he begins to see his shortcomings and failures and how far short he comes of the holiness and perfection that God's law requires, it pulls down the feathers of his pride and lays them in the dust. He weeps over his inability. He is ashamed of his leprous spots. He says with Job, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job 42, 6, Jubilee Bible. God allows this inability in us so that we would call upon Christ. Our sins and failures should lead us to call upon Jesus to pardon our shortcomings and to sprinkle our best duties with His blood. When a person sees that he owes perfect obedience to the law but has nothing to pay, it makes him flee to Christ to be his friend. He calls upon Jesus to answer all the demands of the law for him and to set him free in the court of justice. Application 1 This is cause for humiliation for our fall in Adam. In the state of innocence we were perfectly holy. Our minds were crowned with knowledge, and our wills as a queen swayed the scepter of liberty. But now we can rightly say, The crown has fallen from our head. Lamentations 5.16 we have lost that power that was inherent in us. 
When we look back to our earlier glory, when we shone as earthly angels, we can take up Job's words, O oh, that I were as in months gone by! Job 29, 2. O oh, that it were with us as at the beginning, when there was no stain upon our unstained nature, when there was a perfect harmony between God's law and man's will. But sadly, the scene is now altered, and our strength is gone from us. Every step we take is crooked. We fall short of every law and command of God. Our smallness will not reach the excellence of God's law. We fail in our obedience, and as we fail, we forfeit. This should cause us to mourn deeply and open a fountain of sorrow in our souls. Application 2 It refutes wrong beliefs. It refutes the Armenians who emphasize the power of the will. They argue that they have a will to save themselves. However, by nature we not only lack strength, but we lack the will to do that which is good. Romans 7 19. The will is not only full of weakness, but it is also full of stubbornness. My people did not listen to my voice. Psalm 81 11. The will hangs forth a flag of defiance against God. Those who speak of the sovereign power of the will forget that it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 If the power is in the will of man, then what need is there for God to work in us the ability and power to will? If the air can light itself, what need is there for the sun to shine? Those who talk of the power of nature and their ability to save themselves minimize Christ's merits. Christ has become of no effect to them. Galatians 5 4. Those who promote the power of their will in matters of salvation without the sovereign grace of Christ put themselves completely under the covenant of works. Can they perfectly keep the moral law? Sin is manifested in any blemish at all. If there is but the least defect in their obedience, they are lost. For one sinful thought, The law of God curses them, and the justice of God condemns them. Cursed be their pride who speak of the power of nature as if, by their own inherent abilities, they could rear up a building the top of which should reach to heaven. It refutes those people who brag of perfection. Some people say that they can keep all God's commandments perfectly. I would ask such people whether, at any time, a vain thought has come into their minds. If there has, then they are not perfect. The Virgin Mary was not perfect. Though her womb was pure, being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, yet her soul was not perfect. Jesus understood that Mary was not perfect. Luke 2.49 And are those who claim to keep God's commandments perfectly more perfect than Mary was? Those people who adhere to perfection have no need to confess sin. David confessed sin, Psalm 32, 5. Paul confessed sin, Romans 7, 25. Have these people progressed beyond David and Paul? They say they are perfect and that they never transgress, and where there is no transgression, what need is there for confession? Again, if they are perfect, they do not need to ask for pardon. They can pay God's justice what they owe. Therefore, why pray, Forgive us our debts? Matthew 6 12. It is amazing that the devil rocks some people so sound asleep as to make them dream of perfection. Do they indeed plead, Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude? Philippians 3 15. Perfection in that verse refers to sincerity. God is best able to interpret His own word. He calls sincerity perfection. God refers to Job as a blameless and upright man. Job 1 8. But who is exactly perfect? A person full of diseases may as well say he is healthy 
as for someone full of sins to say he is perfect. Application 3 This should provide encouragement to those who are saved. Though you fail in your obedience and cannot keep the moral law exactly, do not be discouraged. What comfort can be given to a regenerate person under the failures and imperfections of his obedience? It is good to know that a believer is not under the covenant of works, but under the covenant of grace. The covenant of works requires perfect, personal, and perpetual obedience. Under the covenant of grace, however, God will accept less than He required in the covenant of works. 1. In the covenant of works, God required perfection of degrees. In the covenant of grace, He accepts perfection of parts. There He required perfect working, while here He accepts sincere believing. In the covenant of works, God required us to live without sin. In the covenant of grace, He accepts our battle against sin. 2. Though a Christian cannot, on his own, perform all God's commandments, yet Christ, as his security and in his place, has fulfilled the law for him. God accepts Christ's obedience, which is perfect, to satisfy for our obedience, which is imperfect. Since Christ has been made a curse for believers, all the curses of the law have lost their sting. 3. Though a Christian cannot keep the commands of God to his satisfaction, yet he may keep them to God's approval. How is that done? 1. He gives his full assent and consent to the law of God. He gives his assent in his judgment. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Romans 7 12. He gives consent in the will. I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. Romans 7 16. 2. A Christian laments that he cannot keep the commandments fully. When he fails, he weeps. He is not angry with the law because it is so strict, but he is angry with himself because he is so deficient. 3. He takes a sweet delight in the law. I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Romans 7.22. The Greek states, I take pleasure in it. Oh, how I love your law. Psalm 119.97. Although a Christian cannot keep God's law, he loves his law. Although he cannot serve God perfectly, he serves him willingly. 4. It is his sincere desire to walk in all God's commands. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Psalm 119, 5. Though his strength fails, yet his heart beats. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 73, 26. 5. A Christian really strives to obey God's law perfectly, and where he falls short, he runs to Christ's blood to supply his defects. God esteems this sincere desire and real endeavor as perfect obedience. If the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. 2 Corinthians 8, 12 Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet. Song of Solomon 2, 14 Though the prayers of the righteous are mixed with sin, God sees that they desire to pray better. He picks out the weeds from the flowers. He sees the faith and bears with the failing. The saint's obedience, although short of perfection, finds gracious acceptance, having sincerity in it, and having Christ's merits mixed with it. When the Lord sees us truly desire after perfect obedience, He takes it well at our hands. Just as a father who receives a letter from his child takes it as good even though there may be blots and misspelled words in it. Oh, what stains there are in our holy things, but God is pleased to accept it as good. He says, It is my child, and he would do better if he could. I will accept it.
Degrees of Sin Are all transgressions of the law equally abhorrent? Some sins in themselves, and by reason of varying circumstances and intensity, are more heinous in the sight of God than others. He who delivered me to you has the greater sin. John 19.11 The Stoic philosophers taught that all sins were equal. But this scripture verse clearly shows that there is a gradual difference in sin. Some are greater than others. Some are mighty sins, Amos 5.12, and some are crying sins, Genesis 18.21. Every sin has a voice to speak, but some sins cry. As some diseases are worse than others, and some poisons more venomous than others, so some sins are more heinous than others. You too have done evil, even more than your forefathers. Jeremiah 16, 12 You acted more corruptly in all your conduct than they. Ezekiel 16, 47 Some sins have a more evil aspect than others. To steal the king's gold is treason, but to strike the king himself is a higher degree of treason. A foolish thought is a sin, but a blasphemous word is a greater sin. It seems that the Bible teaches that some sins are greater than others. There was a difference in the offerings under the law. The sin offering was greater than the trespass offering. Some sins are not capable of pardon as others are. Therefore, they must be more heinous, such as the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12:31 Some sins have a greater degree of punishment than others. You will receive greater condemnation. Matthew 23:14 Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Genesis 18:25 God would not punish one person more than another if that person's sin was not greater. It is true that all sins are equally wicked in respect to being sins against the infinite God. But, in another sense, all sins are not alike in wickedness. Some sins have more reprehensible circumstances in them, which are like the dye to the wool to give it a deeper color. Those sins are more reprehensible that are committed without any reason, such as when a person swears or becomes angry without any provocation. The less the provocation of sin, the greater is the sin itself. Those sins are more reprehensible that are committed presumptuously or on purpose and willingly. Under the law, there was no sacrifice for presumptuous sins. You shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally, for him who is native among the sons of Israel, and for the alien who sojourns among them. But the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is native or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. Numbers 15, 29 to 30. A sin of presumption heightens and aggravates sin, making it more heinous. To sin presumptuously is to sin against what we know is right and good. Others have been with those who rebel against the light. They do not want to know its ways nor abide in its paths. Job 24, 13 Conscience, like the cherubim, stands with a flaming sword in its hand to deter the sinner. Genesis 3, 24 And yet he will still willingly sin. Did not Pilate sin against conviction and high-handedly in condemning Christ? He knew that because of envy they had handed him over. Matthew 27, 18. He confessed that he found no guilt in him. Luke 23, 14. Pilate's own wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man. Matthew 27, 19. Yet despite all this, he gave the sentence of death against Christ. He sinned presumptuously against an enlightened conscience. To sin ignorantly does something to extenuate and decrease the guilt. 
If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. John 15, 22. That is, their sin would have been less. But for someone to sin against the light he has, and against what he knows to be right, magnifies the sins. These sins make deep wounds in the soul. While other sins may draw blood, presumptuous sins stab at the heart. In what ways can a person sin against what he knows to be right? A person can commit a presumptuous sin when he lives in the total neglect of duty. He is not ignorant that it is a duty to read the Word of God, yet he lets the Bible lie nearby as rusty armor, seldom making use of it. He is convinced that it is a duty to pray in his family, yet he can go days and months without God ever hearing from him. He calls God Father, but never asks his blessing. Neglect of family prayer, as it were, uncovers the roof of men's houses and makes way for a curse to be rained down upon their tables. A person can commit a presumptuous sin when he lives in the same sins he condemns in others. Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another you condemn yourself, or you who judge practice the same things. Romans 2, 1. As Augustine says of Seneca, he wrote against superstition, yet he worshipped those images that he reproved. One man condemns another for a quick temper, yet lives in the same sin himself. A master reproves his apprentice for swearing, yet he himself swears. The snuffers of the tabernacle were of pure gold. Exodus 25:38. Those who reprove and snuff the sins of others had better be free from those sins themselves. The snuffers must be of gold. A person can commit a presumptuous sin when he sins after making a vow or a promise to God. Your vows are binding upon me, O God. Psalm 56.12 A vow is a religious promise made to God to dedicate ourselves to Him. A vow is not only a purpose, but it is a promise. Everyone who makes a promise to follow Jesus makes himself a debtor. He binds himself to God in a solemn manner. To sin after making a vow to promise himself to God and then to give his soul to the devil must certainly be against the highest principles. When a person sins after counsels, admonitions, and warnings, he cannot plead ignorance. The trumpet of the gospel has been blown in his ears. It has sounded a retreat to call him off from his sins. He has been told of his injustice, living in ill will, and keeping bad company, yet he willingly continued in sin. This is to sin against conviction. It aggravates the sin. It is like a weight put into the scale to make his sin weigh heavier. If a beacon is set up to give warning that there are shelves and rocks in the water, yet the mariner still sails there and splits his ship, it is presumption. If he is shipwrecked after ignoring the warnings, who will pity him? It is a presumptuous sin when a person sins against clear warnings and threatening. God has thundered out threatenings against such sins. Surely God will shatter the head of his enemies, the hairy crown of him who goes on in his guilty deeds. Psalm 68, 21. Even if God sets the point of his sword to the chest of a sinner, he will still commit sin. The pleasure of sin delights him more than the threatenings of God frighten him. Like the Leviathan, He laughs at the rattling of the javelin. Job 41 29. He mocks God's threatenings. Let him make speed, let him hasten his work, that we may see it, and let the purpose of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come to pass, that we may know it. Isaiah 5 19. 
For people to see the fiery sword of God's threatening brandished, yet to strengthen themselves in sin, is to sin in an aggravated manner against what they know is right. A person sins presumptuously when he sins under affliction. God not only thunders by threatening, but He lets His thunderbolt fall when He inflicts judgment. He inflicts judgments on a person so that the person can see his sins in his punishment, and yet he still sins. His sin may have been immorality, by which he wasted his strength and his estate. He may have had a severe sickness, and yet while feeling the sting of sin he retains the love of sin. This is to sin against conviction. In the time of his distress, this same king Ahaz became yet more unfaithful to the Lord. 2 Chronicles 28 22. It makes the sin greater to sin against an enlightened conscience. It is full of stubbornness. People give no reason and make no defense for their sins, and yet they are resolved to hold fast to iniquity. An action can be measured and judged by the will involved. The more of the will in a sin, the greater is the sin. We are going to follow our own plans, and each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. Jeremiah 18, 12. Though there is death and hell at every step, we will march on under Satan's banner. What made the sin of apostate angels so great was that it was willful. They had no ignorance in their mind and no passion to stir them up. There was no tempter to deceive them, but they sinned willfully and from choice. To sin against convictions and the light of conscience is joined with rejection and contempt of God. It is bad for a sinner to forget God, but it is worse to condemn Him. Why has the wicked spurned God? Psalm 10, 13. An enlightened sinner knows that he alienates and angers God by his sin, but he doesn't care whether God is pleased or not. He will have his sin. Therefore, such a person is said to reproach God. The person who does anything defiantly, whether he is native or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord. Numbers 15.30 Every sin displeases God. But sins against an enlightened conscience reproach the Lord. To condemn the authority of a prince is to reproach him. It is accompanied with a lack of respect. Fear and shame are banished. The veil of modesty is laid aside. The unjust knows no shame. Zephaniah 3 5. Judas knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He was convinced of it by the authority of heaven and by the miracles Jesus did. And yet Judas boldly went on in his treason, even when Christ said, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. Matthew 26, 23. And he knew that Jesus was referring to him. When he was going about his treason, and Christ pronounced a woe to him, he still proceeded in his treason. Indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Luke 22, 22. You can see that to sin presumptuously against an enlightened conscience dyes the sin a crimson color and makes it greater than other sins. Those sins are more reprehensible than others that are sins of continuance. To carry on sin and to keep sin going is to enhance sin. He who plots treason makes himself a greater offender. Some people's heads are the workplace of the devil. They continually plan mischief, such as those who are inventors of evil. Romans 1 30. Some people invent new ways to swear, while other people look for new ways to deceive or harm others. These were the type of people who invented a decree against Daniel and got the king to sign it. Daniel 6, 5-9 Those sins are greater that proceed from a spirit of hostility. 
To attack holiness is diabolical. While it is a sin to lack grace, it is worse to hate it. In nature, there are things opposed to each other or that are averse to each other, such as the vine and laurel. Some have this type of antipathy against God because of his purity. Get out of the way, turn aside from the path, let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 30 11. If it were in their power, sinners would not only dethrone God, but they would annihilate him. If they had it in their power, God would no longer be God. Thus, sin is stirred up to a greater height. Those sins are of greater magnitude that are mixed with ingratitude. Of all things, God cannot endure to have his kindness ignored or unappreciated. His mercy is seen in being patient with people so long, in pursuing them by his Spirit and ministers, urging them to be reconciled to him. God's mercy is seen in bestowing upon them so many temporal blessings. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Matthew 5.45. To abuse all this love, when God has been filling up the measure of his mercy, yet people continue to fill up the measure of their sins, is high ingratitude, and makes their sins a deeper crimson. Some are worse off because of God's mercy. The vulture, says Aelian, becomes sick from perfumes. So the sinner pursues evil from the sweet perfumes of God's mercy. William Parry was condemned to die, and Queen Elizabeth pardoned him. Yet after he was pardoned, he conspired and plotted the Queen's death. This is how some people deal with God. He bestows mercy upon them, and they plot treason against him. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. Isaiah 1 2. In the fable, the frozen snake, after being warmed, stung him who gave it warmth. Sins against God's mercy are certainly reprehensible. Those sins are more reprehensible than others that are committed with delight. A child of God may sin suddenly or unintentionally, not wanting to sin. The good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Romans 7 19. He is like one who is carried down the stream involuntarily. To sin with delight, though, heightens and greatens the sin. It is a sign that the heart is in the sin. They feed on the sin of my people and direct their desire toward their iniquity. Hosea 4 8. Just as people follow their gain with delight. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Revelation 22 15. To tell a lie is a sin, but to love to tell a lie is a greater sin. Those sins are more reprehensible than others that are committed under a pretense of religion. To cheat and defraud is a sin, but to do it with a Bible in one's hand is a double sin. To be impure is a sin, but to put on a mask of religion to commit the sin makes the sin greater. I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Proverbs 7, 14, 18. She speaks as if she had been at church and had been saying her prayers. Who would ever have suspected her of dishonesty? But behold her hypocrisy! She makes her devotion a preface to adultery. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and chief seats in the synagogues, and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearance's sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Luke 20, 46-47 
The sin was not in making long prayers, for Jesus spent a whole night in prayer, but the sin was to make long prayers so they might do unrighteous actions. This made their sin more horrid. Sins of apostasy are more reprehensible than others. Demas forsook the truth, 2 Timothy 4.10. Dorotheus tells us that Demas later became a priest in an idol temple. To fall is a sin, but to fall away is a greater sin. Apostates cast a disgrace upon the Christian religion. The apostate, says Tertullian, seems to put God and Satan in the balance, and having weighed both their duties, prefers the devil's duties and proclaims him to be the best master. In this respect, the apostate is said to put Christ to open shame. Hebrews 6 6. This makes the sin greater. It is a sin not to profess Christ, but it is a greater sin to deny him. Not to display Christ's banner is a sin, but to run from his banner is a greater sin. A pagan sins less than a baptized apostate. To persecute religion makes sin greater. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Acts 7.52 To reject the true Christian religion is a sin, but to try to destroy that true Christian religion is a greater sin. Antiochus Epiphanes took more long journeys and faced more dangers to persecute and oppose the Jews than all his predecessors had done to obtain victories. Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Luke 3.20. He sinned before by incest, but by imprisoning the prophet he added to his sin and made it greater. Persecution fills up the measure of sin. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. Matthew 23.32. If you pour a glass of water into a cistern, it adds something to it. But if you pour in a bucketful or two, it fills up the measure of the cistern. In the same way, persecution fills up the measure of sin and makes it greater. To sin maliciously makes sin greater. Aquinas and others with similar beliefs say that the sin against the Holy Spirit is due to malice. The sinner does all he can to displease God, and this is even despite the Spirit of grace. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Hebrews 10.29 Thus Julia threw his dagger into the air as if he would have been revenged upon God. Malice swells sin to its full size. It cannot be greater. Once a person has come to this, to blasphemously despise the Spirit, there is only one step lower he can fall, and that is to hell. Sin is made greater and more severe not only when someone sins himself, but also when he tries to make others sin. Some teach errors to the people. These people's sins are greater than those of others. If those who break God's law are committing sin, what immense sin they have who teach others to break God's law. Matthew 5.19 Some people try to destroy others by their bad example. The swearing father teaches his son to swear, damning him by his example. Such people's sins are greater than those of others, and these people will have a hotter place in hell. Application. You can see that all sins are not equal. Some are more heinous than others and bring greater wrath. Be especially careful to avoid these sins. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Psalm 19.13. The least sin is bad enough, 
you don't need to aggravate your sins and make them even more heinous. He who has a little wound should not make it deeper. Beware of those circumstances that increase your sin and make it more heinous. The higher a person is in sinning, the lower he will lie in torment. The Wrath of God What does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and in that which is to come. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41 Sinful man is like a favorite turned out of the king's favor. He deserves the wrath and curse of God. He deserves God's curse. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Galatians 3, 10. When Christ cursed the fig tree, it withered. Matthew 21, 19. In the same way, when God curses anyone, that person withers in his soul. God's curse destroys wherever it comes. The sinful person also deserves God's wrath, which is nothing else but the carrying out of his curse. What is God's wrath? God's wrath is privative. That is, it deprives a person of the smiles of God's face. It is hell enough to be excluded from his presence. In his presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 16:11 His smiling face has that splendor and beauty in it that ravishes the angels with delight. This is the diamond in the ring of glory. If it were such a misery for Absalom not to be able to see the king's face, how miserable it will be for the wicked to be shut out from beholding God's glorious face. To be deprived of the sight of God is the greatest of all punishments. Wrath has come upon them to the utmost. 1 Thessalonians 2.16 God's wrath cannot be resisted. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? Psalm 90.11 Sinners may oppose God's ways, but not His wrath. Will the briars strive with the fire? Will the finite contend with the infinite? Do you have an arm like God? Job 40, 9. God's wrath is dreadful. We tend not to think much about God's wrath, but it is very tremendous and dismal, as if scalding lead would be dropped into one's eyes. The Hebrew word for wrath signifies heat. To show that the wrath of God is hot, therefore, it is compared to fire in the text. Fire, when it is raging, is dreadful, and the wrath of God is like fire. It is most dreadful. Other fire is only as painted fire compared to this. If God's wrath is kindled only a little, and it is dreadful if a spark of it flies into a wicked man's conscience in this life, what will it be when God will stir up all His wrath? Psalm 78, 38 How sad it is with a soul that has deserted God! God then dips His pen in a bitter venom and writes bitter things. Job 13, 26 Your arrows have sunk deep into me. Psalm 38, 2 I was afflicted and about to die from my youth on. I suffer your terrors. I am overcome. Your burning anger has passed over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. Psalm 88, 15-16 Martin Luther, feeling forsaken by God, was in such horror of mind that no blood was seen in his face, but he lay as one dead. If God's wrath is like that, Toward those whom he loves, what will it be toward those whom he hates? If those who sip of the cup of God's wrath find it so bitter, 
what will they do who drink its dregs? For a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed, and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. Psalm 75, 8. Solomon says, The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion. Proverbs 19, 12. What then is God's wrath like? When God assembles all his forces and sets himself in battle against a sinner, how can his heart endure? Can your heart endure, or can your hands be strong in the days that I will deal with you? Ezekiel 22, 14. Who is able to lie under mountains of wrath? God is the sweetest friend, but the most dreadful enemy. The wrath of God will grab hold of every part of a sinner. The wrath of God will take hold of the body of a reprobate. The body which was so tender that it could not bear heat or cold will be tormented in the winepress of God's wrath. Those eyes that before could behold lovely objects will be tormented with the sight of devils. The ears which before were delighted with music will be tormented with the hideous shrieks of the damned. The wrath of God will take hold of the soul of a reprobate. Ordinary fire cannot touch the soul. God's wrath burns the soul. The memory will be tormented to remember what means of grace have been abused. The conscience will be tormented with self-accusations. The sinner will accuse himself for presumptuous sins, for misspending his precious hours, and for resisting the Holy Spirit. The wrath of God is without intermission. Hell is an abiding place, but it is no resting place. There is not a minute's rest. Our earthly pains have some relief. In many diseases and afflictions, the patient has ease at times, but the torments of the damned have no relief. He who feels God's wrath never says, I am at ease. The wrath of God is eternal. So says the text, Eternal fire. No tears can quench the flame of God's anger, not even if we could shed rivers of tears. In all the pains of this life, people hope for relief, hoping that the suffering will not continue long, that either the tormentor or the tormented will die. But the wrath of God is always feeding upon the sinner. The terror of natural fire is that it consumes what it burns. But what makes the fire of God's wrath so dreadful is that it does not consume what it burns. Bernard wrote, Those who are lost will so die as to remain always alive. The sinner will be in the furnace forever. After innumerable millions of years, the wrath of God is as far from ending as it was at the beginning. If all the earth and sea were sand, and every thousand years a little bird would come and take away a grain of sand, it would be a very long while before that vast heap of sand were emptied. But if, after all that time, the damned could come out of hell, there would be some hope. But this word, forever, breaks the heart. How is it consistent with God's justice to punish sin, which perhaps was committed in a moment, with eternal fire? This is due to the heinous nature of sin. Consider the person offended. It is a charge of the highest treason. Sin is committed against an infinite majesty. Therefore, it is infinite, and the punishment must be infinite. Because the nature of man is finite, and a sinner cannot bear infinite wrath all at once, he must therefore satisfy in eternity what he cannot satisfy at once. While the wicked lie scorching in the flames of wrath, they have none to show pity to them. It is some ease of grief to have some to console us, but the wicked have wrath and no pity shown to them. Who will pity them? God will not. 
they mocked his Holy Spirit, and he will now laugh at their calamity. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. Proverbs 1 26. The saints will not pity them. They persecuted the saints upon earth. Therefore, the saints will rejoice to see God's justice executed on them. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. Psalm 58 10. The sinner under God's wrath has no one to speak a good word for him. If an elect person sins, he has one to intercede for him. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2 1. Christ will say, It is one of my friends, one for whom I have shed my blood. Father, pardon him. But the wicked who die in sin have no one to intercede for them. They have an accuser, but no advocate. Christ's blood will not plead for them. They rejected Christ and refused to humble themselves under his authority. Therefore, Christ's blood cries against them. God's wrath is just. The Greek word for vengeance signifies justice. The wicked will drink a sea of wrath, but not one drop of injustice. It is just for God's honor to be restored, and how can that be done except by punishing offenders? He who violates the king's laws deserves the penalty. Mercy acts according to favor, and punishment according to what one deserves. Open shame belongs to us. Daniel 9 8. Wrath belongs to us, for we are sinners. It is due to us as just wages. Which are paid. Application 1. For information God is justified in condemning sinners at the last day. They deserve wrath, and it is not injustice to give them that which they deserve. If a criminal deserves death, the judge does not do him any wrong in condemning him. I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you, who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judged these things, for they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar, saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Revelation 16, 5-7 After these things I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because His judgments are true and righteous. For He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and He has avenged the blood of His bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up for ever and ever. Revelation 19, 1 to 3. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Galatians 6, 7. See what a great evil sin is that exposes a person to God's wrath forever. You can know how evil sin is by the wrath and curse it brings. When you see a man brought to the gallows, you conclude he is guilty of some heinous crime that brings such a punishment. So, when a man lies under the fierce anger of God's wrath and roars out in flames, you must say, How horrid and evil sin is! Those who do not see any evil in sin now will see how reprehensible it looks in the mirror of hell's torments. God's wrath will stop a sinner's amusement. He is now vibrant and exuberant. He sings idle songs to the sound of the harp. Amos 6 5. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. Ecclesiastes 11 9. Let him remember that the wrath and curse of God hang over him, which will shortly, if he does not repent, be executed on him. The sword of God's justice hangs over a sinner, and when the slender thread of life is cut apart, 
it falls upon him. For a drop of pleasure, you must drink a sea of wrath. Your momentary pleasure cannot be as sweet as God's eternal wrath is bitter. The delights of the flesh cannot offset the horror of conscience. It is better to lack the devil's honey than to be stung with the eternal wrath of God. The Garden of Eden, which signifies pleasure, had a flaming sword placed at the east end of it. Genesis 3:24. The garden of carnal and sinful delight is surrounded with the flaming sword of God's wrath. Application 2. For reproof. The foolishness of those sinners is reproved who do not seem to care about the curse and wrath of God that is due to them. No one recalls. Isaiah 44:19. If they were in debt and were about to be arrested, they would care about that. But even though the fierce wrath of God is ready to engage them, they have no concern. Though a beast has no shame, he has fear. He is afraid of fire. But sinners are worse than the beasts, for they do not fear the fire of hell until they are in it. Most have their consciences asleep or numb, but when they will feel the vials of God's wrath dropping, they will cry out, I am in agony in this flame. Luke 16, 24. Application 3. For Exhortation. Let us cherish God's patience, who has not brought this wrath and curse upon us all this time. We have deserved wrath, yet God has not given us what we deserve. We can all agree with Psalm 103, 8, 10, that the Lord is slow to anger, and He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. God has delayed His wrath, and has given us time to repent. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Revelation 2, 21. He is not like a quick-tempered creditor, who demands the debt and gives no time for payment. God shoots off His warning piece so that He does not shoot off His damning piece. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. God adjourns the courts of law to see if sinners will turn. He delays the storm of his wrath. But if people will not heed his warning, they should know that God's great patience is not the same as forgiveness. Let us seek to prevent the wrath we have deserved. How careful people are to prevent poverty or disgrace! Labor to prevent God's eternal wrath, that it may not only be delayed, but removed. What should we do to prevent and escape the wrath to come? We must obtain a saving interest in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only thing standing between us and the wrath of God. He felt God's wrath so that those who believe in Him would never have to feel it, even Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace was a type of God's wrath, yet that furnace did not singe the garments of the three Hebrew men, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Daniel 3.27. Jesus Christ went into the furnace of His Father's wrath, and the smell of the fire of hell will never pass upon those who believe in Him. If we want to prevent the wrath of God, let us take care to avoid those sins that will stir it up. Edmund had a saying, I would rather leap into a furnace of fire than willingly commit a sin against God. There are several fiery sins we must beware of that will provoke the fire of God's wrath. The Fire of Impulsive Anger some who profess Christianity cannot bridle their tongue. They don't care what they say in their anger. 
They will even curse their emotional outbursts. James says that the tongue is set on fire by hell. James 3 6. Oh, beware of a fiery tongue, lest it bring you to fiery torment. The once rich man in Abraham's bosom begged for a drop of water to cool his tongue. Luke 16 24. Cyprian says he had offended the most with his tongue, and now that was the thing most set on fire. The Fire of Malice Malice is a malignant evil whereby we wish evil to others. It is a parasite that lives on blood. It studies revenge. Caligula had a chest where he kept deadly poisons for those against whom he had malice. The fire of malice brings people to the fiery furnace of God's wrath. The Fire of Immorality Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Hebrews 13, 4. Those who burn in immorality are in great danger to burn one day in hell. Let one fire put out another. Let the fire of God's wrath put out the fire of lust. To you who have a well grounded hope that you will not feel this wrath that you deserve, Let me exhort you to be very thankful to God, who has given His Son to save you from this tremendous wrath. Jesus has delivered you from the wrath to come. The Lamb of God was scorched in the fire of God's wrath for you. Christ felt the wrath that He did not deserve, so that you could escape the wrath that you do deserve. Pliny observes that there is nothing better to quench fire than blood. Christ's blood has quenched the fire of God's wrath for you. Your curse be on me, said Rebecca to Jacob, Genesis 27 13. Jesus Christ said to God's justice, Upon me be the curse, that my elect may inherit the blessing. Be patient under all the afflictions that you endure. Affliction can be severe, but it is not wrath. It is not hell. Who would not willingly drink from the cup of affliction if he knew that he would never then drink from the cup of damnation? Who would not be willing to bear the wrath of man if he knew that he would never then feel the wrath of God? Christian, though you may feel God's rod, you will never feel God's bloody axe. Augustine once said, Strike, Lord, where you will. As long as my sin is pardoned. Say, Afflict me, Lord, as you will in this life, since I will escape the wrath to come. The Way of Salvation Faith What does God require of us so that we can escape his wrath and curse due to us for our sin? He requires faith in Jesus Christ and repentance unto life, with the diligent use of all the outward means whereby Christ imparts to us the benefits of redemption. I begin with the first, faith in Jesus Christ. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement in His blood through faith. Romans 3.25 The great privilege in the text is to have Christ for an atoning sacrifice. This not only frees us from God's wrath, but it brings us into His love and favor. The manner of having Christ to be our propitiation is faith in His blood. There is a twofold faith. One, the faith that is believed, this is the doctrine of faith, and two, the faith by which we believe. This is the grace of faith. The act of justifying faith lies in resting. We rest on Christ alone for salvation. As a person about to drown grabs hold on the bough of a tree, so a poor trembling sinner, seeing himself ready to perish, catches hold by faith on Christ, the tree of life, and is saved. The work of faith is by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, faith is called the fruit of the Spirit. 
Galatians 5.22. Faith does not grow in fallen human nature. It is an exotic plant, a fruit of the Spirit. This grace of faith is the most hallowed possession of the human heart. It is the most precious, rich faith, the most holy faith, and the faith of God's elect. Just as gold is most precious among metals, so faith is most precious among the graces. Faith is the queen of the graces. Faith is the condition upon which the gospel depends. Your faith has saved you, not your tears. Luke 7.50. Faith is the vital artery of the soul that gives life. The righteous will live by his faith. Habakkuk 2.4. Though unbelievers breathe, they lack life. Faith, says Clement, is a mother grace. Faith excites and invigorates all the graces. No grace stirs until faith sets it to work. Faith sets repentance to work. It is like fire to the pan. Faith sets hope to work. First we believe the promise, and then we hope for it. If faith did not feed the lamp of hope with oil, it would soon die. Faith sets love to work. Faith works through love. Galatians 5, 6. Who can believe in the infinite merits of Christ without his heart ascending in a fiery chariot of love? It is a universal remedy against all troubles. Faith is the anchor cast into the sea of God's mercy that keeps us from sinking in despair. Other graces have done worthily, but you, O faith, excel them all. In heaven, love will be the main grace, but while we are here on earth, Love must give place to faith. Love takes possession of glory, but faith gives a title to it. Love is the crowning grace in heaven, but faith is the conquering grace upon earth. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5 4. Faith carries away the crown from all other graces. Other graces help to sanctify us, but only faith has the honor to justify us. We are justified by faith. Romans 5 1. How does faith come to be so precious? It is not that faith is a more holy quality or has more worthiness than other graces, but it is precious with respect to its object. Faith lays hold on Christ as the blessed object and brings in his fullness. Faith in itself is but the beggar's hand, but as this hand receives the rich arms of Christ's merits, it becomes precious and claims a superiority over the rest of the graces. Application 1. Of all sins, beware of unbelief. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Hebrews 3.12. People think that as long as they don't get drunk or swear often, it's not a big deal to be unbelievers. This is the gospel sin. It dyes your other sins thoroughly. Unbelief is a Christ-reproaching sin. It belittles Christ's infinite merit as if it could not save. It makes the wound of sin to be broader than the bandage of Christ's blood. This is a high contempt offered to Christ, and it is a deeper spear than that which the Jews thrust into his side. Unbelief is an ungrateful sin. The ungrateful person is to be avoided like a fearful crime. The world herself produces nothing more shameful. Ingratitude is a type of wickedness. Unbelief is being ungrateful for the richest mercy. Suppose a king, to redeem a captive, would part with his crown of gold, and after he had done this, says to the redeemed man, All I desire of you in exchange for my kindness is for you to believe that I love you. If the redeemed man would say, No, I don't believe that, I don't believe that you care for me at all, would not this be deplorable ingratitude? This is the case here. God has sent his Son to shed his blood. 
He only requires us to believe in Him that He is able and willing to save us. No, says unbelief, His blood was not shed for me. I can't persuade myself that Christ has any purpose of love to me. Is not this horrid ingratitude? This enhances the sin and makes it a crimson color. Unbelief is a leading sin. It is the breeder of sin. A life of wickedness has unbelief as its point of origin. Unbelief is a root sin, and the devil labors to water this root, so that the branches will be fruitful. It breeds hardness of heart. Therefore, unbelief and hard hearts go together. He reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Mark 16, 14. Unbelief breeds the heart of stone. He who does not believe in Christ does not care about his sufferings. He does not melt in tears of love. Unbelief freezes the heart. It first defiles the heart, and then it hardens the heart. Unbelief breeds profaneness. An unbeliever will not be bothered by any sin, not by false weights or by false oaths. He will allow treason against God. Judas was first an unbeliever and then a traitor. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. John 6:64. 6, he who has no faith in his heart will have no fear of God before his eyes. Unbelief is a wrath obtaining sin. Bernard calls unbelief an enemy of salvation. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3 18. Dying in unbelief, he is as certain to be condemned as if he were so already. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 3 36. He who doesn't believe in the blood of the Lamb will feel the wrath of the Lamb. The Gentiles who do not believe in Christ will be damned just as certainly as the Jews who blaspheme Him. If unbelief is so fearful and damnable a sin, shouldn't we be afraid to live in it? Application 2 Above all graces, put faith to work in Christ. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3:16. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith. Ephesians 6:16. 6, Say as Queen Esther said, I will go in to the king, and if I perish, I perish. Esther 4:16. She had nothing to encourage her. She proceeded against the law, yet the golden scepter was held forth to her. We have promises to encourage our faith. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. John 6, 37. Let us then advance faith by a holy dependence upon Christ's merits. Christ's blood will not justify without believing. Both are put together in the text, Propitiation in His blood through faith. Romans 3:25 The blood of God without faith in Christ will not save. Christ's sufferings are the liniment to heal a sin-sick soul, but this liniment must be applied by faith. Money in a rich man's hand, even if offered to us, will not enrich us unless we receive it. In the same way, Christ's virtues or benefits will do us no good. Unless we receive them by the hand of faith. Above all graces, put faith to work. Faith in Jesus Christ is most acceptable to God for several reasons. 1. Faith is a God exalting grace, it glorifies God. Abraham did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Romans 4 20. It honors God to a high degree to believe that there is more mercy in God and merit in Christ than sin in us. 
It honors God to believe that Christ has answered all the demands of the law and that His blood has fully satisfied the wrath of God for us. Faith in the Mediator brings more glory to God than martyrdom or the most heroic act of obedience. 2. Faith in Christ is acceptable to God because it is a self denying grace. It makes a person go outside of himself, renounce all self righteousness, and wholly rely on Christ for justification. It is very humble, it confesses its own need, and it lives wholly upon Christ. As the bee sucks sweetness from the flower, so faith draws all its strength and comfort from Christ. 3. Faith is a grace acceptable to God because by faith we present a righteousness to Him that best pleases Him. We bring into court the righteousness of Christ, which is called the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 To bring Christ's righteousness is to bring Benjamin with us, as Joseph required of his brothers. Genesis 42.20 A believer may say, Lord, it is not the righteousness of Adam or of the angels, but it is the righteousness of Christ, who is God man, that I bring before you. The Lord can smell a sweet savour in Christ's righteousness. Application 3 Let us examine and test our faith. There is something that looks like faith, but it is not. Pliny says there is a Cyprian stone that highly resembles a diamond, but it is not a real diamond. Just so there is a false faith in the world. Some plants have the same leaves as others, but the herbalist can distinguish them by the root and taste. In the same way, something may look like true faith, but it can be distinguished in several ways. 1. True faith is grounded upon knowledge. Knowledge carries the torch ahead of faith. There is a knowledge of Christ's great excellencies. I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Philippians 3 8. He is made up of all love and beauty. True faith is a wise and intelligent grace. It knows whom it believes and why it believes. Faith is seated just as much in the understanding as in the will. It has an eye to see Christ as well as a wing to fly to Him. Those, therefore, who are veiled in ignorance or have only an indirect faith to believe as their church believes do not have true and genuine faith. 2. Faith lives in a broken heart. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Mark 9, 24. True faith is always found in a heart bruised because of sin. They, therefore, whose hearts have never sorrowed for sin, have no faith. If a physician would tell us there was a herb that would help us against all infections, but it always grows in a watery place, and we see a herb like it in color, leaf, smell, and blossom, but it was growing upon a rock, we could conclude that it was the wrong herb. Saving faith always grows in a heart humbled for sin, in a weeping eye and a tearful conscience. If, therefore, there is a show of faith, but it grows upon the rock of a hard, impenitent heart, it is not the true faith. 3. True faith is at first nothing but a seed. It is minute and small. It is full of doubts, temptations, and fears. It begins in weakness. It is like the smoking flax. Matthew 12 20. It smokes with desire, but does not flame with comfort. It is at first so small that it is barely discernible. Those who at first have a strong persuasion that Christ is theirs, who leap out of sin into assurance, have a false and spurious faith. The faith that comes to its full stature on its day of birth is a monster. The seed withered that sprung up suddenly. Matthew 13, 5-6 4. 
Faith is a refining grace that consecrates and purifies. Moral virtue may wash the outside, but faith washes the inside. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Acts 15, 9. Faith makes the heart a temple with the inscription, Holy to the Lord. Exodus 28, 36. Those whose hearts are crowded with lusts were never acquainted with the true faith. For one to say he has faith and yet to live in sin is as if one should say he was in health when he is full of cancer. Faith is a pure grace. It is joined with sanctity. Holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. 1 Timothy 3, 9. The jewel of faith is always put in the cabinet of a pure conscience. The woman who touched Christ by faith received a healing and cleansing virtue from him. Mark 5, 28 to 34. 5. True faith is obedient. The obedience of faith. Romans 16, 26. Faith melts our will into the will of God. If God commands duty, even if displeasing to flesh and blood, faith obeys. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. Hebrews 11, 8. It not only believes the promise, but it obeys the command. It is not having an academic knowledge that will indicate that you are believers. The devil has knowledge, but the thing that makes him a devil is that he has no obedience. 6. True faith is increasing. From faith to faith. Romans 1, 17. That is, faith grows from one degree of faith to another. Faith does not lie in the heart as a stone lies in the earth, but as a seed that grows. Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple of Christ, but was afraid to confess him at first. Afterward, he went boldly to Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus. John 19, 38. A Christian's increase in faith is known two ways. A Christian's increase in faith is known by his steadfastness. He is a pillar in the temple of God, firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith. Colossians 2, 7. Unbelievers are skeptical about Christianity. They are doubtful. They question every truth. However, when faith is increasing, it strengthens the spirit and fortifies the Christian. He is able to prove his principles. He holds on to no more than he will die for. As that martyr woman said, I cannot debate for Christ, but I can burn for him. An increasing faith is not like a ship in the midst of the sea that fluctuates and is tossed upon the waves, but is like a ship at anchor that is firm and steadfast. A Christian's increase in faith is known by his strength. He can do that now which he could not do before. When a person has grown up, he can do that which he was not able to do when he was a child. He can carry a heavier burden. In the same way, a growing Christian can bear crosses with more patience. Some might say, But I'm afraid that I have no faith, for it is so weak. If you have faith, even if it is in its infancy, do not be discouraged. A little faith is still faith, just as a spark of fire is still fire. A weak faith can lay hold on a strong Christ. A weak hand can tie the knot in marriage as well as a strong one. The woman in the gospel who simply touched Christ still received virtue from him. The promises are not made to a strong faith, but to a true faith. The promise does not say that he who has a giant faith, who can believe God's love through difficulties, who can rejoice in affliction, who can work wonders, move mountains, or stop the mouth of lions, will be saved. But whoever believes, no matter how small that faith may be. A reed is weak, especially when it is bruised, yet a promise is made to it. A battered reed he will not break off. Matthew 12, 20.
a weak faith can still be fruitful. Weakest things multiply most. The vine is a weak plant, but it is fruitful. The thief on the cross who was newly converted was weak in grace, but how many precious clusters grew upon that tender plant! He rebuked his fellow thief. Do you not even fear God? Luke 23, 40. He judged himself, We indeed are suffering justly. Luke 23, 41. He believed in Jesus when he said, Lord. He made a heavenly prayer, Remember me when you come in your kingdom. Luke 23, 42. Weak Christians can have strong devotion. How strong is the first love which is after the first planting of faith? The weakest believer, as well as the strongest, is a member of Christ, and the weakest member of the body of Christ will not perish. Christ will cut off rotten members, but not weak members. Therefore, Christian, do not be discouraged. God, who desires us to receive those who are weak in faith, will not himself refuse them. Romans 14, 1. Repentance God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Acts 11, 18. Repentance seems to be a bitter pill to take, but it is needed in order to purge out the bad poison of sin. Some antinomian proponents condemn repentance as being legalistic and of the law, but Christ himself preached it. From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17. In his last farewell, when he was ascending to heaven, he commanded that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Luke 24, 47. Repentance is a pure gospel grace. The covenant of works would not accept repentance. It cursed all who could not perform perfect and personal obedience. Galatians 3, 10. Repentance comes in by the gospel. It is the fruit of Christ's purchase that repenting sinners will be saved. It is brought about by the ministry of the gospel while it sets Christ crucified before our eyes. Repentance is not optional, but it is necessary. There is no being saved without it. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. We can be thankful to God that He has left us this plank after our shipwreck. I will show first the counterfeits of repentance. 1. Natural softness and tenderness of spirit. Some have a tender affection in their character, whereby they are apt to weep and soften when they see any object of sympathy and pity. These are not repenting tears, though, for many people weep at another's misery who cannot weep at their own sin. 2. Legal Terrors a man who has lived the life of sin is at last aware of his situation. He sees hell ready to devour him, and he is filled with anguish and horror. But after a while, the tempest of conscience is blown over, and he is calm. He then concludes he is a true penitent because he had felt some bitterness in sin. But this is not repentance. Judas had some trouble of mind. If anguish and trouble were sufficient for repentance, then the damned would be most penitent, for they are most in anguish of mind. There can be trouble of mind where there is no grieving for sin against God. 3. A slight superficial sorrow. When God's hand lies heavy upon someone, such as when a person is sick or afflicted, he may vent a sigh or tear and say, Lord, have mercy. Yet this is not true repentance. Ahab did more than this. He tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted, and he lay in sackcloth and went about despondently. 1 Kings 21 27. His clothes were rent, but not his heart. The eye can be watery, 
yet the heart can remain as hard as flint. An apricot can be soft on the outside, but it has a hard stone within. 4. Good Intent Rising in the Heart Every good intent is not repentance. Some think that if they intend in their hearts to break off their sins and become religious, that this is repentance. As the devil can stir up bad thoughts in the godly, so the Spirit of God can stir up good intent in the wicked. Herod had many good thoughts and inclinations stirred up in him by John the Baptist's preaching, yet he did not truly repent, for he still lived in incest. 5. Vows and Resolutions What vows and solemn declarations some people make in their sickness, that if God would heal them they will be new people, but afterward they are as bad as ever. The people of Israel said they would not sin, but God reminded them that despite their declaration Israel pursued her idols and On every high hill and under every green tree you have lain down as a harlot. Jeremiah 2.20 6. Leaving Some Terrible Sin A person may depart from some sins, but keep others. Herod reformed many things that were wrong, but he kept his Herodias. A person might leave an old sin in order to begin a new one. A person might leave immorality or wasteful spending only to pursue covetousness. That is not repentance, but is merely to exchange one sin for another. These are the counterfeits of repentance. If you find that yours is a counterfeit repentance and you have not repented sincerely, fix what you have done wrong. As in the body, if a bone is set wrong, the surgeon has no way but to break it again and set it properly, and so you must do by repentance. If you have not repented properly, you must have your heart broken again in a godly manner and be more deeply afflicted for sin than ever. This brings me to show what repentance consists of. It consists of two things, humiliation and transformation. Humiliation if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled. Leviticus 26.41 There is, as some say, a twofold humiliation, or breaking of the heart. One, attrition, as when a rock is broken in pieces, this is done by the law, which is a hammer to break the heart. And two, contrition, as when ice is melted into water. This is done by the gospel, which is as a fire to break or melt the heart. The sense of abused kindness causes contrition. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Jeremiah 23, 29. Transformation or Change Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. Repentance works a change in the whole person. Just as when wine is put into a glass of water and runs into every part of the water, changing its color and taste, so true repentance does not rest in one part, but spreads itself into every part. Repentance causes a change in the mind. Before conversion, a person loves sin and speaks in defense of it, as Jonah did when he said, I have good reason to be angry, Jonah 4, 9, or I have a good reason to swear or break the Sabbath. When someone becomes truly repentant, his judgment is changed. He looks upon sin as the greatest evil. The Greek word for repentance signifies after wisdom, such as after having seen how awful and damnable a thing sin is, we change our mind. Paul, before conversion, truly thought he should do many things that were contrary to the name of Jesus. Acts 26, 9. But after he repented, he was of another mind. I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Philippians 3, 8. 
Repentance causes a change of judgment. Repentance causes a change in the affections, which move under the will as soldiers move under the orders of the commander in chief. It transforms the affections. It turns rejoicing in sin into sorrowing for sin. It turns boldness in sin into holy shame. It turns the love of sin into hatred of sin. As Ammon hated Tamar more than he ever loved her, 2 Samuel 13.15, so the true penitent hates sin more than he ever loved it. I hate every false way, Psalm 119.104. Repentance works a change in the life. Though repentance begins at the heart, it doesn't stay there, but it goes into the life. It begins at the heart. Wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem. Jeremiah 4.14. If the spring is corrupt, no pure stream can run from it. Even though repentance begins at the heart, it doesn't stay there, but it changes the life. What a change repentance made in Paul! It changed the persecutor into a preacher. What a change it made in the jailer! He took Paul and Silas, washed their stripes, and set food before them. Acts 16, 33-34. What a change it made in Mary Magdalene! She who before kissed her lovers with immoral embraces, kissed Christ's feet. She who used to curl her hair and dress it with costly jewels, made it a towel to wipe Christ's feet. Her eyes that used to sparkle with lust and with impure glances to entice her lovers became fountains of tears to wash her Saviour's feet. Her tongue that used to speak vainly and loosely became an instrument set in tune to praise God. This change of life has two things in it. One, This change of life involves breaking off the sin. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness. Daniel 4.27 This breaking away from sin must have three qualifications. Breaking away from sin must be universal. You must break away from all sin. One disease can kill as well as many. Holding on to one sin can damn a person as well as holding on to many sins. The real penitent breaks off secret, gainful, habitual sins. He takes the sacrificing knife of mortification and death to self and runs it through the heart of his dearest lusts. Breaking away from sin must be sincere. It must not be done out of fear, but upon spiritual grounds as from abhorrence and disgust toward sin and a principle of love to God. If sin didn't have such evil effects, a true penitent would forsake it anyway out of love to God. The best way to separate things that are frozen is by fire. When sin and the heart are frozen together, the best way to separate them is by the fire of love. Will I sin against the gracious Father and abuse that love that pardons me? And breaking away from sin must be perpetual. You must break away from sin so as to never have anything to do with sin any more. What more have I to do with idols? Hosea 14.8 Repentance is a spiritual divorce that must last until death. 2. This change of life involves returning unto the Lord. It is called repentance toward God, Acts 20, 21. It is not enough to leave old sins when we repent, but we must also engage in God's service. When the wind leaves the west, it turns to a different direction. The repenting prodigal not only left his harlots, but he also arose and went to his father. Luke 15, 18. In true repentance, the heart points directly to God, just as the needle points to the North Pole. Application Let us all take upon ourselves this great work of repentance. Let us repent sincerely and quickly. 
let us repent of all our sins. Let us repent of our pride, our impulsive anger, and our unbelief. Without repentance, there is no remission of sin. It is not consistent with the holiness of God's nature to pardon a sinner while he is in the act of rebellion. Do not meet God with weapons, but with tears in your eyes. To stir you up to a melting, repentant state of mind and heart, I offer some advice. Consider what there is in sin that would cause you to continue in the practice of it. It is the accursed thing. Joshua 7 11. It is the spirit of evil. It defiles the soul's glory. It is like a stain to beauty. It is compared to a plague and an affliction. 1 Kings 8 38. Nothing so much changes one's glory into shame as sin. Without repentance, sin leads to final damnation. The moment of sin passes, but the guilt remains. Sin at first shows its color in the glass, but afterward it bites like a serpent. Those locusts in Revelation 9, 7-10 are an emblem of sin. On their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings. Sin unrepented of ends in tragedy. It has the devil for its father, shame for its companion, and death and damnation for its wages. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 What is there in sin, then, that people would continue in it. Don't say that it is sweet. Who would desire the pleasure that kills? Repentance is very pleasing to God. There is no sacrifice like a broken heart. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Psalm 51, 17. Augustine caused this sentence to be written over his bed when he was sick. When the widow brought empty vessels to Elisha, the oil was poured into them. 2 Kings 4 5. Bring God the broken vessel of a contrite heart, and he will pour in the oil of mercy. Repenting tears are the joy of God and of angels. Luke 15 7. Doves delight to be near the water, and surely God's Spirit, who once descended in the likeness of a dove, takes great delight in the waters of repentance. Mary stood at Jesus' feet, weeping. Luke 7, 38. She brought two things to Christ, tears and ointment, but her tears were more precious to Christ than her ointment. Repentance leads the way to pardon. That's why they are joined together. Repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. Luke 24, 47. Pardon of sin is the richest blessing. It is enough to make a sick man well. No resident will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. Isaiah 33, 24. Pardon brings us the richer charter of the promises. Pardoning mercy is the source that makes all other mercies taste sweeter. It sweetens our health, riches, and honor. David had a crown of pure gold set upon his head. Psalm 21, 3. That which David most blessed God for was not that God had set a crown of gold upon his head, but that he had set a crown of mercy upon his head. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion? Psalm 103, 4. What was this crown of mercy and loving kindness? You can see in verse 3, Who pardons all your iniquities? David rejoiced more that he was crowned with forgiveness than that he wore a crown of pure gold. What is it that makes the way for pardon of sin but 
repentance. When David's soul was humbled and broken, the prophet Nathan brought him good news. The Lord also has taken away your sin. 2 Samuel 12.13 Some people might say, But my sins are so great that if I would repent, God wouldn't pardon them. God will not back away from His promise, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 3.12 If your sins are as rocks, upon your repentance the sea of God's mercy can drown them. Wash yourselves, Isaiah 1.16. Wash in the laver of repentance. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Isaiah 1.18 Manasseh was a crimson sinner, but when he humbled himself greatly, the golden scepter of mercy was held forth. When his head was a fountain to weep for sin, Christ's side was a fountain to wash away sin. It is not the magnitude of sin that destroys, but lack of repentance. The Jews, who had a hand in crucifying Christ, learned that upon their repentance the blood they had shed was a sovereign balm to heal them. When the prodigal came home to his father, he had the robe and the ring placed upon him, and his father kissed him. Luke 15, 20-22 If you leave your sins, God will become a friend to you. All that is in God will be yours. His power will be yours to help you. His wisdom will be yours to counsel you. His Spirit will be yours to sanctify you. His promises will be yours to comfort you. His angels will be yours to guard you. His mercy will be yours to save you. There is much sweetness in tears of repentance. The soul is never more enlarged and more inwardly delighted than when it can warmly melt for sin. Weeping days are festival days. The Hebrew word for repent signifies to take comfort. Your grief will be turned into joy. John 16:20. Christ turns the water of tears into wine. David, who was the great mourner in Israel, was also the sweet singer. 2 Samuel 23, 1. The joy that a true penitent finds is a foretaste of the joy of paradise. The wicked man's joy turns to sadness, but the penitent's sadness turns to joy. Though repentance seems at first to be thorny and bitter, yet from this thorn a Christian gathers grapes. These are all considerations that should open a vein of godly sorrow in our souls so that we can both weep for sin and turn from it. If ever God restores comfort, it is to His mourners. I have seen His ways, but I will heal Him. I will lead Him and restore comfort to Him and to His mourners. Isaiah 57, 18 When we weep tears of repentance, let us look up to Christ's blood for pardon. Say, Lord, wash my tears in your blood. We drop sin with our tears, and we need Christ's blood to wash them. This repentance must not be for a few days only, like mourning for a friend which is soon over, but our repentance must be the work of our lives. Godly sorrow must not be stopped until death. After sin is pardoned, we must still repent when we fall to sin again. Some people shed a few tears for sin, and when, like the widow's oil, they have continued a while, they cease. Many people wipe off the ointment of repentance if it begins to sting a little, but it must remain on, and repentance for sins must not be plucked off until death. Then, as with all other tears, these tears of godly sorrow will be wiped away. What can we do to obtain a repentant frame of heart? Seek God for it. It is His promise to give a heart of flesh, Ezekiel 36, 26, and to pour on us a spirit of mourning, Zechariah 12, 
10. Seek God's Holy Spirit. He causes His wind to blow and the waters to flow. Psalm 147, 18. When the wind of God's Spirit blows upon us, then the waters of repentant tears will flow from us. The Word of God. The third way to escape the wrath and curse of God and to obtain the benefit of redemption by Christ is by the diligent use of ordinances, in particular, the Word, sacraments, and prayer. I begin with the best of these ordinances the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 What is meant by the word performing its work in you who believe? The Word of God is said to work effectually in us when it has the good effect upon us for which it was appointed by God, when it works a powerful illumination and thorough reformation. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. Acts 26 18. The opening of their eyes denotes illumination, and turning them from Satan to God denotes reformation. How is the Word of God to be read and heard so that it can become effectual to salvation? This question consists of two branches. One, how can the word be read effectually? And two, how can we hear the word so that it will be effectual and saving to our souls? How can the word be read effectually? 1. Let us have a reverential regard of every part of Scripture. They are more desirable than gold. Psalm 19.10 Value the book of God above all other books. It is a golden epistle, written by the Holy Spirit and sent to us from heaven. More specifically, to raise our respect for the Word of God, the Scriptures are a spiritual mirror by which we dress our souls. It shows us more than we can see by the light of natural conscience. This may reveal heinous sins, but the mirror of the Word also shows us sins of the heart, vain thoughts, unbelief, and much more. It not only shows us our spots, but it washes them away. The Scripture is an armory from which we can get spiritual artillery to fight against Satan. When our Savior was tempted by the devil, he used armor and weapons from Scripture. It is written, Matthew 4, 4, 7. The Holy Scripture is a panacea or universal medicine for the soul. It gives a recipe to cure deadness of heart, Psalm 119, 50, pride, 1 Peter 5, 5, and unbelief, John 3, 36. It is a garden of remedies from which we can gather a herb or an antidote to expel the poison of sin. The leaves of Scripture like the leaves of the tree of life, are for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22, 2. Should this not cause a reverential admiration and respect for the Word? 2. If we desire the written Word to be effectual to our souls, let us read it with intenseness of mind. Search the Scriptures. John 5, 39. The Greek word signifies to search as for a vein of silver. The Bereans examined and searched the Scriptures daily to see if what they were being taught was what the Bible really said. Acts 17.11 The word meaning examined or searched used in that verse signifies to make a meticulous and critical search. Apollo was mighty in the Scriptures. Acts 18.24. Some rush through or skim a chapter in haste, and they get no good out of it. If we want the Word to be effectual and saving, we must pay attention to and observe every passage of Scripture. That we may be diligent as we read the Scriptures, consider that the Bible is the only standard of conduct. 
the rule and platform by which we are to live our lives. It contains in it all things needful to salvation. It informs us what duties we are to do and what sins we are to avoid. Psalm 19, 7-9 God gave Moses a pattern of how he wanted the tabernacle to be made, and Moses was to go exactly according to the pattern. Exodus 25, 9 The Word of God is the pattern that God has given us, in writing, for how we are to live our lives. How careful, therefore, should we be in pursuing and looking over this pattern? As the written word is our pattern, so it will be our judge. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. John 12, 48 We read of the opening of the books, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. Revelation 20, 12. One book that God will open is the book of the Scripture, and He will judge people out of it. He will ask, Have you lived according to the standard and decrees of this word? The word has a double work to teach and to judge. 3. If we want the written word to be effectual to our souls, we must bring faith to the reading of it. We must believe it to be the word of the eternal God. It comes with authority, and it shows its commission from heaven. Thus says the Lord, It is of divine inspiration. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 The oracles of Scripture must be more certain to us than a voice from heaven. 2 Peter 1.18-19 Unbelief incapacitates the virtue of Scripture and renders it ineffectual. People first question the truth of the Scripture and then they fall away from it. 4. If we want the written word to be effectual to salvation, we must delight in it as our spiritual refreshment. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. Jeremiah 15, 16 All true solid comfort is obtained from the word. The Word, as Chrysostom says, is a spiritual garden, and the promises are the fragrant flowers or spices in this garden. How should we delight to walk among these beds of spices? Is it not a comfort, in all uncertain, puzzling cases, to have a counsellor to advise us? Your testimonies also are my delight, they are my counsellors. Psalm 119.24 is it not a comfort to find our evidences for heaven? And where should we find them except in the Word of God? 1 Thessalonians 1 4 5. The Bible is a sovereign medicine or comfort in an hour of distress. This is my comfort in my affliction that your Word has revived me. Psalm 119 50. It can turn all our water into wine. We should take great delight in the Word. Only those who come to the Word with delight go from it with success. 5. If we desire the Scripture to be effectual and saving, we must be sure, after we have read the Word, to hide it in our hearts. Your Word I have treasured in my heart, that I may not sin against you. Psalm 119.11 the word locked up in the heart is a preservative against sin. Why did David hide the word in his heart? That I may not sin against you. Just as one would carry medicine with him when he comes near an infected place, so David carried the word in his heart as a sacred remedy to preserve him from the infection of sin. When the sap is hidden in the root, it makes the branches fruitful. When the seed is hidden in the ground, the corn springs up. 
When the word is hidden in the heart, it brings forth good fruit. 6. If we desire the written word of God to be effectual in our lives, let us labor not only to have its light in our heads, but its power in our hearts. Let us endeavor to have it written out and then written a second time in our hearts. The law of his God is in his heart. Psalm 37 31. The word says, Clothe yourselves with humility. 1 Peter 5 5. Let us be low and humble in our own eyes. The word calls for holiness. Let us labor to partake of the divine nature and to have something conceived in us that is of the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1 4. When the word is copied out into our hearts like this, and we are changed into its likeness, it is made effectual to us and becomes to us a savor of life. 7. When we read the Holy Scriptures, let us look up to God for a blessing. Let us beg the Spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may see the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.10. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Ephesians 1.17. Ask God that the same Spirit who wrote the Scriptures would enable us to understand it. Pray that God would give us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him, that we would savor a sweetness in the word we read. 2 Corinthians 2.14. David tasted it as sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Psalm 19.10. Let us pray that God would not only give us His word as a standard of holiness, but that He would also give us His grace as a principle of holiness. The way of salvation continued. How can we hear the word so that it will be effectual and saving to our souls? 1. Give much attention to the word preached. Let nothing pass without taking special notice of it. All the people were hanging on to every word he said. Luke 19 48. They hung upon the words of Jesus. A woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshipper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Acts 16 14. Give attention to the word as a matter of life and death. For this purpose, banish all empty and irrelevant thoughts that will distract you from the work at hand. These fowls will be coming to the sacrifice. Therefore, we must drive them away. Genesis 15 11. An archer may take proper aim, but if someone stands right beside him and bumps him when he is about to shoot, he will not hit the target. Christians can have good intentions in hearing the word of God, but beware of irrelevant thoughts that will prod and hinder you in God's service. Banish dullness. The devil gives many hearers a drug to make them tired, so that they cannot keep their eyes open at a sermon. They eat so much on the Lord's day that they are more suited for the pillow and couch than the temple. Frequent and regular sleeping at a sermon shows high contempt and irreverence of the preaching of the Word of God. It gives a bad example to others. It calls your sincerity into question. It is the devil's seed time. While his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares. Matthew 13 25. Shake off drowsiness, just as Paul shook off the viper. Acts 28 5. Be serious and attentive in hearing the word. It is not an idle word for you, indeed, it is your life. Deuteronomy 32 47. When people do not pay attention to what God speaks to them in His Word, God pays just as little attention to what they say to Him in prayer. 2. If you desire the Word preached to be effectual, 
Come with a holy hunger for the Word. Long for the pure milk of the Word. 1 Peter 2 2. The thirsting soul is the thriving soul. In nature, one can have an appetite and no digestion, but it is not so in Christianity. Where there is a great appetite for the Word, there is, for the most part, good digestion. Come with a soul hungering after the Word, and desire that it may not only please you, but that it will also profit you. Don't look at the designs on the dish more than at the food. Don't look at the eloquence and the oratory more than at the meat of the Word. It suggests an unhealthy appetite to feed on sweets and treats rather than on wholesome food. 3. If you desire the preaching of the Word to be effectual, come to it with tenderness upon your heart. Because your heart was tender, 2 Kings 22, 19. Preaching to hard hearts is like shooting an arrow against a bronze wall. The Word does not enter. It is like setting a gold seal upon marble that makes no impression. Come to the preaching of the Word with a melting condition of the heart. It is the melting wax that receives the stamp of the seal, and when the heart is in a melting state, it will better receive the stamp of the preached word. When Paul's heart was melted and broken for sin, he cried, What shall I do, Lord? Acts 22.10. Don't come with hard hearts. Who can expect a crop when the seed is sown upon stony ground? 4. If you want the word to be effectual, receive it with meekness. In humility receive the word. James 1.21. Meekness involves a submissive frame of heart to the word, a willingness to hear the counsels and reproofs of the word. Contrary to this meekness is fierceness of spirit, whereby people are ready to rise up in rage against the word. Proud people and guilty people cannot endure to hear of their faults. Proud Herod put John in prison, Mark 6.17. The guilty Jews, being reminded that they crucified Christ, stoned Stephen, Acts 7.59. To tell people of sin is to hold a mirror to someone, showing him his flaws and deformities when he cannot endure to see his own face. Stubbornness of heart is also contrary to meekness. This is when people are resolved to hold on to their sins no matter what the Word of God says. Rather, we will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her. Jeremiah 44, 17. Take heed of this. If you desire the Word of God to be preached effectually, Lay aside fierceness and stubbornness, and receive the word with meekness. By meekness the word preached comes to be grafted. As a good branch that is grafted in a bad stem changes the nature of the fruit and makes it taste sweet, so when the word is grafted into the soul it sanctifies it and causes it to bring forth the sweet fruit of righteousness. 5. Mingle the preaching of the word with faith. The word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Hebrews 4 2. If you leave out the main ingredient in a medicine, it hinders its effectiveness. Do not leave out the ingredient of faith. Believe the word, and so believe it as to apply it. When you hear Christ preached, apply him to yourselves. This is to put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Romans 13.14. When you hear a promise spoken, apply it. This is to sip the promise, the nectar of the flower, and turn it into honey. 6. Do not only be attentive while hearing the preaching of the word, but also be retentive after hearing. 
For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it, lest we should let it run out as water out of a sieve. Hebrews 2 1. If the ground does not retain the seed sown into it, there can't be a good crop. Some people have memories like leaking vessels. The sermons they hear are soon gone, and no good is done in their hearts and lives. If food does not stay and digest in the stomach, it will not nourish. Satan labors to steal the word out of the mind. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. Mark 4.15. Our memories should be like the chest of the ark where the law was kept. 7. Reduce your hearing to practice. Live on the sermons you hear. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and do your commandments. Psalm 119, 166. Rachel was not content that she was beautiful, but her desire was to be fruitful. What is a knowing head without a fruitful heart? Filled with the fruit of righteousness. Philippians 1 11. It is obedience that crowns hearing. The type of hearing that does not reform the life will never save the soul. 8. Earnestly ask God to accompany His Word with His presence and blessing. The Holy Spirit must make it all effectual. Pastors can prescribe the remedy, but it is God's Spirit who must make it work. Augustine said, He who converts souls has his pulpit in heaven. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who are listening to the message. Acts 10.44 It is said that the chemist can draw oil out of iron. God's Spirit can produce grace in the most strong-willed heart. 9. If you desire to have the Word work effectually to your salvation, make it familiar to you. Discuss what you have heard after you get home. Let my tongue sing of your Word. Psalm 119, 172. One reason why some people don't get more good from what they hear is that they never speak to anyone else about what they have heard, as if sermons were such secrets that they must not be spoken of again or as if it were a shame to speak about matters of salvation. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. Malachi 3.16 Application 1 As you care for your soul, be careful that the word does not become powerless to you. There are some to whom the word preached is unproductive. This includes those who condemn the word, instead of judging themselves, they judge the word, those who live in contradiction to the word, this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, Isaiah 30, 9, those who are more hardened by the word, they made their hearts like flint, so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by His Spirit through the former prophets. Zechariah 7, 12. When people harden their hearts willfully, God hardens them judicially. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Isaiah 6, 10. The word of God is unproductive in these people. Would it not be sad if a person's food did not nourish him, but instead turned to poison? Be careful that the word preached is not profitless and to no purpose in you. Application 2 Consider three things. 1. If the word of God does us no good, there is no other way by which we can be saved. This is God's institution and the main instrument that he uses to convert souls. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. 
Luke 16, 31. If the Word of God preached to you does not persuade you, then you would not be convinced even if an angel would come to you out of heaven and preach about the excellency of the glorified state and the joys of heaven, and would do so in the most moving manner. If a condemned spirit would come from hell and preach to you in flames, telling you what a dreadful place hell is, shouting out the torments of the damned, it might make you tremble, but it would not convert you, if the preaching of the word will not do it. 2. The devil is pleased when you come to the word of God without being changed by God. He doesn't care if you hear the word preached often, as long as it does you no good. He's not an enemy to hearing, but to benefiting. Even if the minister holds out the truth of the scriptures to you, the devil does not care, as long as you don't drink the sincere milk of the word. The devil doesn't care how many sermon pills you take, as long as they do not work upon your conscience. And 3. If the word preached is not effectual to people's conversion, it will be effectual to their condemnation. The word will be effectual one way or the other. If it doesn't make your hearts better, it will make your chains heavier. We feel sorry for those who don't have the word of God preached. But it will be worse with those who hear it but are not sanctified by it. Dreadful is the case of those who go loaded with sermons to hell. I will conclude with the words of the author of Hebrews We are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. Hebrews 6 9. The Lord's Supper. While they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing he broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Mark 14, 22-24. The Lord's Supper is the most spiritual and sweetest ordinance that was ever instituted. This deals specifically with the person of Christ. In prayer we draw near to God. In the sacrament we become one with Him. In prayer we look up to Christ. In the sacrament, by faith, we touch Him. In the word preached we hear Christ's voice. In the sacrament we feed on Him. What names and titles in Scripture are given to the sacrament? It is called the Lord's Table. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. 1 Corinthians 10 21. The Roman Catholics call it an altar, not a table. The reason is because they turn the sacrament into a sacrifice and pretend to offer up Christ bodily in the Mass. The Bible calling it the Lord's Table shows with what reverence and solemn devotion we should approach these holy mysteries. The Lord takes notice of the frame of our hearts when we come to His table. The king came in to look over the dinner guests. Matthew 22, 11. We dress well when we come to the table of royalty, and when we are going to the table of the Lord we should dress ourselves by holy meditation and heart consideration. Many people think it is enough to simply come to the sacrament, but they do not care whether or not they come according to the ordinance. 1 Chronicles 15:13. They might not have had even one serious thought beforehand regarding where they were going. They only clothed themselves by the mirror and not by the Bible. John Chrysostom calls it the dreadful table of the Lord. And so it is to those who come unworthily. The sacrament is called the Lord's Supper. This signifies that it is a spiritual feast. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11:20. It is a royal feast. God is at this feast. Christ in both natures, God and man, is the subject of this supper. It is called a communion. 
Is not the bread which we break a sharing, communion, in the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10.16 The sacrament being called a communion shows, 1. This ordinance is for believers only, because no one else can have communion with Christ in these holy mysteries. Communion is based upon union. Faith alone gives us union with Christ, and by virtue of this we have communion with Him in His body and blood. No one but the spouse communes with her husband. A stranger might drink of his cup, but she alone has his heart and communes with him in a marital manner. In the same way, strangers might drink of the cup, but only believers drink of Christ's blood and have communion with him. 2. The sacrament being called a communion shows that it is a symbol of love, a bond of that unity and love that should be common among Christians. Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. 1 Corinthians 10.17 As many grains make one loaf of bread, so many Christians are one body. A sacrament is a love feast. The early Christians, as Justin Martyr notes, had their holy greetings at the Blessed Supper, in token of that dearness of affection that they had for each other. It is a communion, and therefore there must be love and union. The Israelites ate the Passover with bitter herbs, and we must eat the sacrament with bitter herbs of repentance, but not with bitter hearts of wrath and malice. The hearts of the communicants should be knit together with the bond of love. You brag of your faith, says Augustine, but show me your faith by your love to the saints. For as light and heat are inseparable in the sun, so faith and love are inseparably twisted together. Where there are divisions, the Lord's Supper is not properly a communion, but a disunion. What is the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is a visible sermon wherein Christ crucified is set before us. It is a sacrament of the New Testament wherein our communion with Christ is signified and sealed up to us by receiving the holy elements of bread and wine. It is a divinely instituted sacrament, wherein Christ's death is showed forth by giving and receiving bread and wine, and wherein the worthy receivers by faith are made partakers of His body and blood and of all the benefits flowing from thence. For further explanation of the nature of the Lord's Supper, I will refer to its beginnings. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Matthew 26 26 27. Jesus took bread. Here is the master of the feast, or the institutor of the sacrament. The Lord Jesus took bread. The only one suited to institute a sacrament is the one who is able to give virtue and blessing to it. He took bread. His taking the bread was one part of consecrating the elements and setting them apart for a holy use. As Christ consecrated the elements, so we must labor to have our hearts consecrated before we receive these holy mysteries in the Lord's Supper. How unfitting it is to see anyone come to these holy elements with hearts full of pride, covetousness, or envy. These people receive the devil in the dipped morsel along with Judas, John 13:26, and are no better than those who crucified the Lord of glory. He blessed it. This is another part of the consecration of the element. Christ blessed it. He blesses, and it will be blessed. He looked up to heaven for a benediction upon this newly established ordinance. He broke it. The broken bread and the poured out wine signify to us the agony and shame of Christ's sufferings, the rending of Christ's body on the cross, 
and the outpouring of blood that poured from his blessed side. He gave it to them. Christ's giving the bread signifies that he gave himself and all his benefits to us freely. Though he was sold, yet he was given. Judas sold Christ, but Christ gave himself to us. He gave it to them. That is, he gave it to the disciples. This is bread for the children. Jesus does not cast these pearls before swine. Matthew 7 6. Whether Judas was present at the supper is a topic of some debate. I incline to think he was not, for Christ said to the disciples, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Luke 22 20. He knew that his blood was never shed effectually and intentionally for Judas. In eating the Passover, he gave Judas a morsel which was a bit of unleavened bread dipped in a sauce made with bitter herbs. Judas, having received the morsel, went out immediately. John 13 30. Suppose Judas was there, he would have received the elements, but not the blessing. Take, eat. This expression of eating signifies four things. 1. Take, eat. The extraordinary union between Christ and his saints. As the food that is eaten merges with the body and becomes one with it, so by eating Christ's flesh and drinking his blood spiritually, we partake of his merits and graces, and are supernaturally one with them. I in them. John 17 23. 2. Take, eat. Eating shows the infinite delight the believing soul has in Christ. Just as eating is grateful and pleasing to the palate, so feeding on Christ by a lively faith is delicious. Lactantius said, The soul knows no sweeter food. There is nothing as sweet as to feed on Christ crucified. This is a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. Isaiah 25, 6. 3. Take, eat. Eating signifies nourishment. Just as food is delicious to the palate and is nourishing to the body, so eating Christ's flesh and drinking his blood is nourishing to the soul. The new creature is nourished at the table of the Lord to everlasting life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. John 6, 54. And for take, eat, this shows the wisdom of God, who restores us by the same means by which we fell. We fell by taking and eating the forbidden fruit, and we are recovering by taking and eating Christ's flesh. We died by eating the tree of knowledge, and we live by eating the tree of life. This is my body. These words have been much argued about between us and the Roman Catholics. This is my body, that is, by a metaphor, it is a sign and figure of my body. The Roman Catholics teach transubstantiation, that the bread, after consecration, is turned into the very substance of Christ's body. We say that we receive Christ's body spiritually. They say that they receive Christ's body physically, which is contrary to Scripture. Scripture affirms that the heavens must receive Christ's body until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Acts 3.21 Christ's body cannot be at the same time in heaven and in the host. Aquinas says, it is not possible by any miracle that a body should be locally in two places at once. Besides, it is absurd to imagine that the bread in the sacrament would be turned into Christ's flesh, and that his body that was crucified before would be made again of bread. This is my body is as if Christ had said, This is a sign and representation of my body. He took the cup. The cup is a figure of speech for the wine in the cup. 
It represents the blood of Christ shed for our sins. The taking of the cup signifies the abundance of merit in Christ and the fullness of our redemption by Him. He not only took the bread, but He also took the cup. He gave thanks. Jesus gave thanks that God had given these elements of bread and wine to be signs and seals of man's redemption by Christ. Christ's giving thanks shows His benevolence, or love, to mankind, who did so rejoice and bless God that lost humanity was now in a way of recovery, and that we should be raised higher in Christ than we ever were in innocence. He gave the cup to them. Why then do any dare to withhold the cup from others? This is to pollute and restrict the ordinance, changing it from its original intent and use. Christ and his apostles administered the sacrament in both kinds, the bread and the cup. 1 Corinthians 11:24-25. The cup was received in the ancient church for the space of 1400 years, as is confessed by two Roman Catholic councils. Christ says specifically, "Drink from it all of you." Matthew 26:27 as foreseeing the sacrilegious irreverence of the church of Rome in keeping back the cup from the people the roman catholic council of constance speaks plainly but presumptuously that although christ instituted and administered the sacrament in both kinds the bread and the wine yet the authority of the holy canons and the customs of the mother church think good to deny the cup to the laity Thus, as the Roman Catholic priests make Christ only half a Savior, so they administer to the people only half a sacrament. The sacrament is Christ's last will and testament. This is my blood of the covenant. Matthew 26, 28. To change or take away anything from a person's will and testament is a great wrong. How much more evil is it to alter and mangle Christ's last will and testament? It certainly is a great insult to Christ. What are the purposes of the Lord's Supper? It is an ordinance appointed to confirm our faith. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. John 4:48. Christ sets the elements before us so that by these signs our faith may be strengthened. As faith comes by hearing, so faith is confirmed by seeing Christ crucified. The sacrament is not only a symbol to represent Christ, but it is a seal to confirm our interest in Him. The purpose of the sacrament is to continue to remember Christ's death. Do this in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11:25 If a friend gives us a ring at his death we wear it to continue to remember our friend much more should we keep the memorial of Christ's death in the sacrament his death lays a foundation for all the magnificent blessings that we receive from him the covenant of grace was agreed on in heaven but sealed upon the cross Christ has sealed all the articles of peace in His blood. Remission of sin flows from Christ's death. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 28. Consecration, or making us holy, is the fruit of Christ's death. How much more will the blood of Christ, who, through the eternal Spirit, Offer himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9 14. Christ's intercession is made available to us by virtue of his death. He could not have been acknowledged as an advocate if he had not been first a sacrifice. Our entering into heaven is the fruit of his blood. We have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10:19. He could not have prepared mansions for us if he had not first purchased them by his death. We have much cause to commemorate his death in the sacrament.
In what manner are we to remember the Lord's death in the sacrament? The sacrament of the Lord's Supper is not just a historical remembrance of Christ's suffering and death. Judas remembered his death and betrayed him. Pilate remembered his death and crucified him. Our remembering his death in the sacrament must be a mournful as well as a joyful remembrance. A mournful remembrance. We should not be able to look on Christ crucified with dry eyes. They will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Zechariah 12.10. O Christian, when you look on Christ in the sacrament, remember how often you have crucified him. The Jews only did it once, but you have done so often. Every profanity is a nail with which you pierce his hands. Every unjust sinful action is a spear with which you wound his heart. O oh, remember Christ with sorrow, to think you would make his wounds bleed again. A joyful remembrance. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. John 8:56. When a Christian sees a sacrament day approaching, he should rejoice. This ordinance of the supper is a pledge of heaven. It is the mirror in which we see him whom our souls love. It is the chariot by which we are carried up to Christ. When Jacob saw the wagons and the chariots that were to carry him to his son Joseph, his spirit revived. Genesis 45:27. God has appointed the sacrament on purpose to cheer and revive a sad heart. When we look on our sins, we have reason to mourn. But when we see Christ's blood shed for our sins, we rejoice. In the sacrament, our needs are supplied and our strength is renewed. We meet there with Christ, and does not this call for joy? A woman who has been long kept away from the company of her husband is glad of his presence. At the sacrament, the believing spouse meets with Christ. He says to her, All I have is yours. My love is yours to comfort you. My mercy is yours to save you. How can we participate in the sacrament and think about the shed blood of Christ and not rejoice? Christ's blood is the key that opens heaven. Without it, we would have all been shut out. The purpose of the sacrament is to work in us an endearing love for Christ. When Christ bleeds for us, we can well say, Behold how he loved us. John 11.36. Who can see Christ die and not be lovesick? It is a heart of stone that Christ's love will not melt. The purpose of the sacrament is to subdue corruption. To see Christ crucified for us is a means to crucify sin in us. His death, like the water of jealousy, makes the thigh of sin to rot. Numbers 5.27 How can a wife endure to see the knife that was used to kill her husband? How can we endure those sins that made Christ veil His glory and shed His blood? When the people of Rome saw Caesar's bloody robe, they were incensed against those who slew him. Sin has torn the white robe of Christ's flesh And dyed it a crimson color. The thoughts of this should make us seek to be avenged of our sins. Another purpose of the sacrament is the nourishment and increase of all the graces, such as hope, zeal, and patience. The word preached brings about grace, and the Lord's Supper nourishes it. The body by feeding increases strength, and the soul grows stronger by feeding on Christ through the sacrament. When my spiritual strength begins to fail, I know a remedy, says Bernard. I will go to the table of the Lord. There will I drink and recover my decayed strength. There is a difference between dead stones and living plants. The wicked, who are stones, receive no spiritual increase, but the godly, 
who are plants of righteousness and are being watered with Christ's blood, grow more fruitful in grace. Why are we to receive this Holy Supper? We are to celebrate the Lord's Supper because it is an essential duty. Take, eat. Notice that this is a command of love. If Christ had commanded us to do some great thing, would we not have done it? Had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? 2 Kings 5.13 If Jesus had instructed us to have given him thousands of rams or to have parted with our children, would we not have done it? How much more should we obey when he only says, Take, eat. Let my broken body feed you. Let my blood poured out save you. Take, eat. This is a command of love, and will we not cheerfully and willingly obey? We are to celebrate the Lord's Supper because it is insulting Christ to stay away. Wisdom has prepared her food, she has mixed her wine, she has also set her table. Proverbs 9 2. Christ has furnished his table. He has set bread and wine, representing his body and blood, before his guests, and when they willfully turn their backs upon the ordinance, he looks upon it as disregarding and disrespecting his love, and it makes the fury rise up in his face. I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Luke 14 24. I will shut them out of my kingdom. I will provide them a dreadful banquet where weeping will be the first course, and gnashing of teeth will be the second course. The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13, 41-42 Should the Lord's Supper be administered often? Yes. As often as you eat this bread, 1 Corinthians 11.26. The ordinance is not to be celebrated once a year, or only once in our lives, but often. A Christian's own necessities should cause him to come here often. His corruptions are strong, and therefore he needs to come here often for an antidote to expel the poison of sin. His graces are weak. Grace is like a lamp. That is apt to go out if it is not often fed with oil. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. Revelation 3 2. How greatly then do those who only very seldom come to this ordinance sin against God? Can they thrive who for a long time abstain from food? There are some who never partake of the Lord's Supper, and this is a great contempt offered to Christ's ordinance. They indirectly say, Let Christ keep his feast to himself. How contradictory man is! He will eat when he should not, and he will not eat when he should. When God says, Eat not of this forbidden fruit, then he will be sure to eat. When God says, Eat of this bread and drink of this cup, then he refuses to eat. Are all to come carelessly to this holy ordinance? No, for that would make the Lord's table a common table. Christ forbids you to throw your pearls before swine. Matthew 7 6. The sacramental bread is children's bread, and it is not to be cast to the profane. Just as when God gave the law and set boundaries around the mount so that no one would touch it, so God's table should be guarded, so that the profane would not come near. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain, or touch the border of it. Exodus 19, 12. In earlier times, after the sermon was over, and the Lord's Supper was about to be celebrated, an officer stood up and cried, Holy things for holy men! and then several members of the congregation departed. I would rather have my hand cut off, says Chrysostom, 
than to give Christ's body and blood to the profane. The wicked do not eat Christ's flesh, but they tear it. They do not drink his blood, but they spill it. These holy mysteries in the sacraments are mysteries, which the soul is to tremble at. Sinners defile the holy things of God. They poison the sacramental cup. We read that the wicked are to be set at Christ's feet, not at his table. Psalm 110, 1. In order to receive the supper of the Lord worthily, and so it may bear fruit in us, there must be some preparation. We must solemnly prepare ourselves before we come. We must not rush upon the ordinance crudely and irreverently, but must come with respect and order. There was a great deal of preparation for the Passover, and the sacrament comes in the place of it. 2 Chronicles 30, 18-19 This solemn preparation for the ordinance consists in examining ourselves, in clothing our souls before we come, which is by washing in the water of repentance, and by putting on the garment of grace, and in earnestly and prayerfully seeking a blessing upon the ordinance. Solemn preparation for the sacrament consists in self-examination. A man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 1 Corinthians 11.28 It is not only advice, but it is a command. A man must examine himself. This is as if a king would say, Let it be made a law. These elements in the supper, having been consecrated by Jesus Christ to a high mystery, represent his body and blood. Therefore, there must be preparation. If there is preparation, there first must be self examination. Let us be serious in examining ourselves, as our salvation depends upon it. We like to question and investigate when we examine other things. We will not take gold until we examine it and make sure it is genuine. We will not take land before we examine the title. Will we not then be as exact and questioning in examining the state of our souls? What is required for this self examination? There must be a solemn seclusion of the soul. We must set ourselves apart and withdraw for some time from all secular employment so that we can be more serious in the work. You don't examine your financial statements in a crowd of people, and we cannot examine ourselves when we are in a crowd of worldly business. We read that a man who was on a journey could not come to the Passover because his mind was full of secular cares, and his thoughts were taken up about his journey. Numbers 9.13 When we are upon the work of self-examination, We do not need to be in a hurry or to have any distracting thoughts, but we should get alone in a quiet, solitary place so that we can be more focused upon the work. What is self examination? Self examination is the setting up of a court of conscience and keeping a record there, so that by strict scrutiny a person can see how matters stand between God and his soul. It is a spiritual inquisition, a heart anatomy, whereby someone looks at his heart in pieces as with a watch and sees what is defective therein. It is a dialogue with one's self. I will meditate with my heart. Psalm 77, 6. David called himself to account and interrogated his own heart. Self examination is a critical inquiry or search. As the woman in the parable lit a candle and searched for her lost coin, so the conscience is the candle of the Lord. Luke 15, 8. Use this candle to search for what you can find worked in you by the Holy Spirit. What is the standard by which we are to examine ourselves? The standard by which we must examine ourselves is the Holy Bible. We mustn't make the standard to judge ourselves our own reasoning or the good opinions that others might have of us. As the goldsmith brings his gold to the touchstone to test the gold's purity, 
so we must bring our hearts to a scripture touchstone. To the law and to the testimony. Isaiah 8.20 What does the word of God say? Are we cut off from sin? Are we renewed by the Spirit? Let the word decide whether we are suitable communicants or not. We judge colors by the light of the sun, and so we must judge the state of our souls by the sunlight of Scripture. What are the main reasons for self examination before we approach the Lord's Supper? Self examination is a duty imposed. A man must examine himself. 1 Corinthians 11.28. The Passover was not to be eaten raw. Exodus 12.9. To come to such an ordinance casually, without examination, is to come in an improper manner, and is like eating the Passover raw. Self examination is not only a duty imposed, but it is a duty opposed. There is nothing to which the heart is naturally more opposed than self examination. We can know that a duty is good if the heart opposes it. Why does the heart so oppose it? Because it crosses the tide of corrupt nature and is contrary to flesh and blood. The heart is guilty, and does a guilty person love to be examined? The heart opposes it. Therefore, examine yourselves, for that duty is good that the heart opposes. Self-examination is a needful work. Without it, a person can never tell how he's doing and whether he has grace or not. This makes things very uncomfortable for the person. He doesn't know if he would suddenly die what will become of him, to what coast he will sail, whether to hell or to heaven. As Socrates said, I am about to die, and the gods know whether I shall be happy or miserable. How needful, therefore, is self examination, that a person can search and can know the true condition of his soul, and can know how it will go with him in eternity. Self examination is needful with respect to the excellence of the sacrament. Let him eat of that bread, that excellent bread, that consecrated bread, that bread that is not only the bread of the Lord, but the bread that is the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.28 Let him drink of that cup, that precious cup that is perfumed and spiced with Christ's love, that cup that holds the blood of God sacramentally. Cleopatra put a jewel in a cup that contained the price of a kingdom. This sacred cup that we are to drink of, enriched with the blood of God, is above the price of a kingdom. It is worth more than heaven. Therefore, coming to such a royal feast and having a whole Christ, both his divine and human nature, to feed on, how much we should examine ourselves beforehand, so that we will be suitable guests for such a magnificent banquet. Self-examination is needful because God will examine us. That was a sad question. Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? Matthew twenty two twelve. People are reluctant to ask themselves the questions. O oh, my soul, are you a suitable guest for the Lord's table? Are there not some sins you have to mourn over? Are there not some indications that you are prepared for heaven that you must demonstrate? When people will not ask themselves these questions, then God will ask them, How did you get in here to my table unprepared? How did you get in here with an unbelieving or profane heart? Such questions will cause a heart to tremble. God will examine a person as the chief captain wanted to examine Paul with scourging. Acts 22 24. It is true that the best saint, if God would weigh him on the scales of justice, would be found deficient. Daniel 5 27. But when a Christian has made an impartial search and has labored to deal honestly between God and his own soul, Christ's merits will cast in some grains of allowance onto the scales. Self examination is needful because of secret corruption in the heart that will not be discovered without searching. 
There are hidden pollutions in the heart, Augustine said. When Joseph's brothers were accused of having the cup, they were ready to swear that they did not have it. But upon searching for it, it was found in one of their sacks. Genesis 44, 12. It is the same with a Christian and sin in his heart. Little does a Christian realize what pride, atheism, and immorality are in his heart until he searches it. If there is such hidden wickedness, like a spring running underground, then we need to examine ourselves so that we will be humbled and repent upon realizing our secret sin. Hidden sins, if not searched out, defile the soul. If corn lies long in the husk, the husk defiles the corn. In the same way, sins long hidden defile our duties. It is therefore necessary, before we come to the Holy Supper, that we search out these hidden sins, just as Israel searched for leaven before they came to the Passover. Self examination is needful because without it we can easily be deceived about our own hearts. The heart is more deceitful than all else. Jeremiah 17, 9. Many people's hearts will tell them they are prepared for the Lord's table. Christ asked the sons of Zebedee, Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? Matthew 20, 22. Can you drink such a bloody cup of suffering? They said to him, We are able. In the same way, the heart will suggest to a person that he is fit to drink of the sacramental cup, that he has on the wedding garment. Augustine wrote, The heart is a great impostor. Just as a cheating salesman will sell someone damaged merchandise, so the heart will make a person content with apparent grace instead of saving grace. The heart will convince a person that a tear or two shed is repentance, or that a few lazy desires are faith. Blue and red flowers growing among corn look like good flowers, but are only beautiful weeds. The foolish virgins' vessels looked as if they had oil in them, but they had none. Matthew 25, 3. Therefore, to prevent being deceived, and so we do not accept false grace as true, We need to make a thorough search of our hearts before we come to the Lord's table. Self examination is needful because of the false fears that the godly are inclined to nourish in their hearts that make them go sad to the sacrament. As those who have no grace and neglect to examine themselves presume their hearts are fine, so those who have grace and neglect to examine themselves are ready to despair. Many of God's children look upon themselves through the dark lenses of fear. They fear Christ is not formed in them. They fear they have no right to the promise. These fears in the heart cause tears in the eye. But if they would only search and examine, they might find that they have saving grace. Are not their hearts humbled for sin? What is this but the bruised reed? Do not they weep after the Lord? What are these tears but seeds of faith? Do they not thirst after Christ in an ordinance? What is this but the new creature crying for milk? You can see seeds of grace here, and if Christians would examine their hearts, they might see that there is something of God in them. If so, their false fears would be prevented, and they could approach the holy mysteries in the Lord's Supper with peace. Self-examination is needful in respect to the danger of coming unworthily without it. He shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.27 Dutch theologian Hugo Grotius wrote, It is as if he were butchering Christ. God deals with him as with one who crucified the Lord Jesus. He does not drink Christ's blood, but he sheds it. That brings a curse upon him, as when the Jews said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. Matthew 27, 25. Nothing 
is more comfortable than the virtue of Christ's blood. Nothing is more dreadful than the guilt of it. We must examine ourselves before the sacrament because of the difficulty of the work. Difficulty raises a noble spirit. Self examination is difficult because it is an inward work, it lies with the heart. External acts of devotion are easy. To lift up the eye, to bow the knee, or to read over a few prayers is as easy as for the Roman Catholics to count over a few rosary beads. But to examine oneself, to take the heart in pieces, to test our fitness for the Lord's Supper by the standard of Scripture, is not easy. Introspective acts are hardest. The eye cannot see itself, except in a mirror, and we must have the mirror of the Word and conscience to see our own hearts. It's easy to notice the faults of others, but it is hard to find our own faults. Self examination is difficult with regard to self love. Ignorance blinds, but self love flatters. What Solomon says of love, love covers all transgressions, is certainly true of self love. Proverbs 10 12. To a person looking upon himself in the flattering mirror of self love, his virtues appear greater than they are, and his sins seem less. Self love causes a person to justify himself rather than examine himself. Self love makes one think the best of himself, and he who has a good opinion of himself does not suspect himself. Since he does not suspect himself, he is not inclined to examine himself. Therefore, since the work of self examination is so difficult, it requires even more impartiality and diligence. Difficulty should motivate us to be diligent. We must examine ourselves before we come because of the benefit of self examination. The benefit is great, however, it ends up. If upon examination we find that we have no grace in truth, the mistake is discovered, and the danger is prevented. If we find that we have true grace, we can take comfort in it. He who learns that he has even the smallest degree of grace is like one who has found his box of proof. He is happy, for he is a suitable guest at the Lord's table, is heir to all the promises, and is as certain to go to heaven as if he were already there. What? Must we examine? We must examine our sins. See if any dead fly has spoiled the sweet ointment. Ecclesiastes 10 1. When we come to the sacrament, as the Jews did before the Passover, we should search for leaven, and when we find it, we should burn it. Let us search for the leaven of pride. This sours our holy things. Will a humble Christ be received into a proud heart? Pride keeps Christ out. His presence within blocks the entrance, so that nothing else can enter in. To a proud person, Christ's blood has no virtue. It is like a refreshing drink put into a dead person's mouth. It loses its usefulness. Let us search for the leaven of pride and cast it away. Let us search for the leaven of covetousness. The Lord's Supper is a spiritual mystery, representing Christ's body and blood. What would a worldly heart do here? Dirt puts out fire, and worldliness quenches the fire of holy love. Dirt is heavy and cannot ascend. A soul covered with the world cannot ascend to heavenly meditations. Covetousness or greed is idolatry. Colossians 3 5. Will Christ come into the heart where there is an idol? Search for this leaven before you come to this ordinance. How can an earthly heart commune with that God who is a spirit? Can a lump of dirt kiss the sun? Search for the leaven of hypocrisy. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Luke 12, 1. Aquinas describes hypocrisy as the counterfeiting of virtue. 
The hypocrite is a living pageant, for he only makes a show of Christianity. He gives God his knee, but not his heart, and God gives him bread and wine in the sacrament, but no Christ. Oh, let us search for this leaven of hypocrisy and burn it. We must examine our graces. I will only mention one our knowledge. We are to examine whether we have knowledge. If we lack knowledge, we cannot give God our reasonable service. Romans 12 1. Knowledge is necessary in one who participates in the Lord's Supper. Without knowledge, there can be no suitability for the sacrament. A person cannot be prepared to come to the Lord's table who has no goodness, but without knowledge, the mind is not good. It is not good for a person to be without knowledge. Proverbs 19 2. Some say they have good hearts, even though they lack knowledge. That is as if one should say that his eye is good, but it lacks sight. Under the law, when the plague of leprosy was on a man's head, the priest was to pronounce him unclean. Leviticus 13. The ignorant person has the plague in his head. He is unclean. Ignorance is the womb of sin. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. 1 Peter 1 14. Therefore, it is necessary, before we come to the Lord's table, to examine what knowledge we have in the main fundamentals of the Christian religion. Let it not be said of us that, To this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. 2 Corinthians 3.15 In this intelligent age, we must have some insight into the mysteries of the gospel. I fear, though, that we are like Rachel, who was beautiful but barren. Genesis 29.17 Therefore, let us examine whether we are properly equipped and proficient in knowledge. Is it strong? Does our knowledge warm our heart? Clearness in our understanding results in zeal in our doing. Saving knowledge not only directs, but awakens. It is the light of life. John 8, 12 Is our knowledge practical? We hear much, but do we love the truths we know? The right kind of knowledge is that which not only adorns the mind, but also reforms the life. This solemn preparation for the sacrament consists in clothing our souls before we come. This soul clothing involves two things. One, it involves washing in the basin of repenting tears. To come to this ordinance with the guilt of any sin unrepented of makes way for further hardening of the heart and it gives Satan fuller possession of it. They will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. Zechariah 12.10 The cloud of sorrow must drop into tears. We must grieve for the filthiness and for the unkindness in every sin that is against the love of Christ who died for us. When Peter thought of Christ's love in calling him out of his sinfulness to make him an apostle, and to carry him up to the Mount of Transfiguration, where he saw the glory of heaven in a vision, and then to consider his denying Christ, it broke his heart. He went out and wept bitterly. Matthew 26, 75 Before we come to a sacrament, to think about our sins against the loving mercies of the God the Father, the bleeding wounds of God the Son, and the blessed inspirations of God the Holy Spirit, It is enough to fill our eyes with tears and to put us into a holy agony of grief and contrition. We must be distressed for sin and be divorced from it. Before the serpent drinks, it casts up its poison. In this we must be wise as serpents. Before we drink of the sacramental cup, we must cast up the poison of sin by repentance. Augustine said, He truly laments the sins he has committed, who does not commit the sins he has lamented. And two, 
The soul clothing involves enlivening and stirring up the garment of grace into active practice. I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you, that is, the gifts and graces of the Spirit. 2 Timothy 1 6. The Greek word for kindle afresh signifies to blow up grace into a flame. Grace is often like fire in the embers, which needs blowing up. It is possible that even a godly person may not come so well prepared to this ordinance if he has not before made an effort to get his heart in proper form, to stir up grace into vigorous exercise, and though he does not eat and drink damnation, yet he does not receive consolation in the sacrament. A solemn preparation for the sacrament consists in earnestly and prayerfully seeking God's blessing upon the ordinance. The benefit of the sacrament depends upon the blessing of the Spirit. When Jesus instituted the sacrament, he blessed the elements. Jesus took bread and blessed it. Matthew 26 26. The sacrament will do us no good, no farther than it is blessed to us. Before we come to it, then, we ought to pray for a blessing that it may not only be a sign to represent Jesus Christ and all his benefits, but that it will also be a seal to confirm and an instrument to convey Christ and all his benefits to us. We are to pray that this great ordinance may be poison to our sins and food to our graces. As with Jonathan, whose eyes were enlightened when he tasted the honeycomb, 1 Samuel 14.27, so by receiving this holy ordinance our eyes may be enlightened to properly discern the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11.29. We should earnestly seek a blessing upon the ordinance before we come. The sacrament is like a tree full of fruit, but none of this fruit will fall unless shaken by the hand of prayer. In order for the sacrament to bear fruit in us, we must properly participate in it. This consists of four things. 1. A right participation of the Lord's Supper is when we draw near to God's table in a humble sense of our unworthiness. We do not deserve one crumb of the bread of life. We are poor, impoverished creatures who have lost our glory. We are like a vessel that is shipwrecked. We smite on our chest as the publican, saying, God be merciful to us sinners. Luke 18.13. This is partaking of the ordinance properly. It is part of our worthiness to see our unworthiness. 2. We rightly partake of the Lord's table when we are filled with breathing of soul and inflamed desires after Christ. Only His blood can quench these desires. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Matthew 5, 6. They are blessed not only when they are filled, but also while they are thirsting. 3. A right participation of the Lord's Supper is when we receive it in faith. Without faith we get no good. What is said of the word preached that it did not profit them because it was not united by faith, is true of the sacrament. Hebrews 4, 2. Christ turned stones into bread, and unbelief turns the bread into stones, stones that do not nourish. We partake rightly when we come in faith. Faith has a twofold act, adhering and applying. By the first we go over to Christ and by the second we bring Christ over to us. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20 This is the grace we must put to work. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Acts 10.43 Philo calls it the eye of faith. 
It is the eagle eye that discerns the Lord's body. It causes a virtual contact. It touches Christ. After his resurrection, Jesus told Mary not to touch him. John 20:17. She was not to touch him with the hands of her body, but he tells us to touch him with the hand of our faith. Faith makes Christ present to the soul. The believer has a real presence in the sacrament. The body of the sun is in the sky, but the light of the sun is in the eye. Christ's essence is in heaven, but he is in a believer's heart by his light and influence. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Ephesians 3:17. Faith is the palate that tastes Christ. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, 1 Peter 2, 3. It causes the bread of life to nourish. Believe and you have fed, said Augustine. Faith makes us one with Christ, Ephesians 1, 23. Other graces make us like Christ, but faith makes us members of Christ. And four, we partake rightly of the sacrament when we receive it in love. Love to Christ. Who can see Christ pierced with a crown of thorns, sweating in his agony, and bleeding on the cross, without his heart being endeared in love to him? How can we not love him who has given his life a ransom for us? Love is the spiced wine and juice of the pomegranate that we must give to Christ. Song of Solomon 8 2. Our love for this superior and blessed Jesus must exceed our love for other things as the oil runs above the water. Though we cannot, with Mary, bring our ointment to anoint his body, we do more than this when we bring him our love, which is sweeter to him than all ointments and perfumes. Love to the Saints This is a love feast. Though we must eat it with the bitter herbs of repentance, yet we do not need to eat it with the bitter herbs of malice. Would it not be sad if all the food we eat would end up hurting us? He who comes in malice to the Lord's table turns all he eats to his hurt. He who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. 1 Corinthians 11.29 Come in love. It is the same with love as it is with fire that you keep burning all day upon the hearth, but at special times you make it larger. We must have love for all people, but for the saints who are our fellow members here, we must draw out the fire of our love larger. We must show our great love and affection for them by cherishing them, by choosing their company, by doing all duties of love to them, by counseling them in their doubts, comforting them in their fears, and by supplying them in their needs. Thus, one Christian may be an Ebenezer to another, 1 Samuel 7.12, and as an angel of God to him. The sacrament cannot be beneficial to the person who does not receive it in love. If a person drinks poison and then drinks a pleasant drink, the pleasant drink will do him little good. In the same way, the pleasant drink of the remembrance of Christ's blood will do no good to one who has the poison of malice in his soul. Therefore, come to the Lord's Supper in love and charity. Application 1 Learn how precious this sacrament should be to us. It is a sealed deed to bestow the blessings of the new covenant to us. A small piece of wax put to a parchment is made the instrument to confirm transferring wealth or imparting lordship to another. In the same way, These elements of bread and wine in the sacrament, though in themselves of no great value, yet being consecrated to be symbols to confirm the covenant of grace to us, are of more value than all the riches of the Indies. Application 2 As the sacrament is such a holy mystery, let us come to it with holy hearts. No heart but a consecrated heart can receive a crucified Christ. Christ in his conception lay in a pure virgin's womb, and at his death 
his body was wrapped in clean linen and was put into a new virgin tomb that had never been defiled. If Christ would not lie in an unclean grave, then certainly he will not be received into an unclean heart. Purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. Isaiah 52 11. If those who carried the vessels of the Lord were to be holy, then certainly those who are to be the vessels of the Lord and who are to hold Christ's blood and body ought to be holy. Application 3. Christ's body and blood in the sacrament are a most sovereign healing potion or comfort to a distressed soul. Having poured out his blood, God's justice is fully satisfied. There is enough in the death of Christ to answer all doubts. If sin is the poison, the flesh of Christ is an antidote against it. If sin is as red as scarlet, Christ's blood is of a deeper color and can wash away sin. If Satan strikes us with his darts of temptation, here is a precious balm out of Christ's wounds to heal us. The chastening for our well being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Isaiah 53 5. So what if we feed upon the bread of affliction, as long as in the sacrament we feed upon the bread of life? Christ received properly in the sacrament is a universal medicine for healing and a universal remedy for cheering our distressed souls. Prayer I give myself unto prayer. Psalm 109, 4, Jubilee Bible I will not write in great detail here about prayer, as it will be considered more fully in the Lord's Prayer. It is one thing to pray, and another thing to be given to prayer. A person who prays frequently is said to be given to prayer, just as someone who often distributes alms is said to be given to charity. Prayer is a glorious ordinance. It is the soul's trading with heaven. God comes down to us by His Spirit, and we go up to Him by prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is offering up our desires to God for things agreeable to His will in the name of Christ. Prayer is offering up our desires, and therefore it is called making known our requests. Let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4 6. In prayer, we come as humble petitioners, begging to have our request granted. Prayer is offering up our desires to God. Prayer is not to be made to anyone but God. The Roman Catholics pray to saints and angels who do not know our problems. Abraham does not know us. Isaiah 63 16. All angel worship is forbidden. Colossians 2, 18-19. We must not pray to anyone except one whom we may believe in. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Romans 10, 14. We cannot believe in an angel for salvation, and therefore we must not pray to him. Why must prayer be made to God alone? Because only he hears prayer. O you who hear prayer, Psalm 65 2. God is known to be the true God because he hears prayer. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. 1 Kings 18 37. Because only God can help. We can look to secondary causes and cry, as the woman did, Help my Lord, O King. The King replied, If the Lord does not help you, from where shall I help you? 2 Kings 6, 26-27 If we are in outward distress, only God can send help from heaven and save us. If we are in inward agony, only He can pour in the oil of joy. 
Therefore, prayer is to be made only to Him. We are to pray for things agreeable to His will. When we pray for outward things, such as for riches or children, God might see these things as not to be good for us. Our prayers should be in accord with His will. We can undoubtedly pray for grace. This is the will of God, your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4 3. There must be no strange incense offered. Exodus 30 9. When we pray for things that are not agreeable to God's will, we are offering strange incense. We are to pray in the name of Christ. To pray in the name of Christ is not just to mention Christ's name in prayer, but it is to pray in the hope and confidence of his goodness. Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. 1 Samuel 7 9. We must carry Christ the Lamb in the arms of our faith, and that is how we will prevail in prayer. When Uzziah wanted to offer incense without a priest, God was angry and struck him with leprosy. 2 Chronicles 26 16 to 19. When we do not pray in Christ's name and in the hope of his mediation, we offer up incense without a priest, and we can expect to be met with divine rebukes and to have God answer us by dreadful things. What are the specific parts of prayer? Confession, the acknowledgement of sin. Supplication, when we either condemn and pray against some evil, or we request the obtaining of some good. Thanksgiving, when we give thanks for mercies received, which is the most excellent part of prayer. In petition, we act like humans. In giving thanks, we act like angels. What are the specific kinds of prayer? Mental prayer, in the mind. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. 1 Samuel 1, 13. Vocal prayer. My voice rises to God, and I will cry aloud. Psalm 77, 1. Exclamatory prayer, which is a sudden and short elevation of the heart to God. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah 2, 4. Inspired prayer, when we pray for those things that God puts into our hearts. The Spirit helps us with sighs and groans. Romans 8 26. Both the expressions of the tongue and the impressions of the heart, as far as they are right, are from the Spirit. Prescribed prayer. Our Saviour has given us a pattern of prayer. Matthew 6 9 13. God prescribed a set form of blessing for the priests. Numbers 6, 23-26 Public prayer, when we pray in the audience of others. Prayer is more powerful when many join and unite their forces. A united force is stronger. If two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 18, 19 and private prayer, when we pray by ourselves. Go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. Matthew 6, 6. That prayer that is most likely to prevail with God is that which is properly accomplished. A good medicine has the right ingredients, and a prayer is good and is most likely to prevail with God that has these seven ingredients in it. 1. Prayer must be mixed with faith. He must ask in faith without any doubting. James 1, 6. Believe that God hears and will in due time grant your request. Believe His love and truth. Believe that He is love, and therefore He will not deny you. Believe that He is truth, and therefore He will not deny Himself. Faith sets prayer to work. 
Faith is to prayer what the feather is to the arrow. It feathers the arrow of prayer and makes it fly swifter, piercing the throne of grace. The prayer that is faithless is fruitless. 2. It must be a tender prayer. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Psalm 51 17. The incense was to be beaten. Exodus 30 36. Representing the breaking of the heart in prayer. Some Christians might say that they cannot pray with such gifts and eloquence as others. As Moses said, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Exodus 4.10 You don't need to be eloquent, but can you not weep? Does your heart melt in prayer? Weeping prayer prevails. Tears drop as pearls from the eye. Jacob wept and made supplication and had power over the angel. Hosea 12, 4. 3. Prayer must be fired with zeal and fervency. Fervent prayer accomplishes much. James 5, 16. Cold prayers never prevail. Prayer without fervency is like a sacrifice without a fire. Prayer is referred to as pouring out the soul, signifying earnestness. I have poured out my soul before the Lord. 1 Samuel 1.15 Formality starves prayer. Prayer is compared to incense. May my prayer be counted as incense before you. Psalm 141.2 Hot coals were to be put to the incense to make it aromatic and fragrant. Fervency of devotion in prayer is like coals to the incense. It makes prayer ascend as a sweet perfume. Christ prayed with strong cries. He offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. Hebrews 5, 7 Such a cry pierces the clouds, Martin Luther said. Fervent prayer makes heaven's gates fly open. To cause holy devotion and fire of soul in prayer, consider the following points. Prayer without fervency is not prayer. It is speaking, not praying. Lifeless prayer is no more prayer than the picture of a man is a man. One may say, as Pharaoh, I have had a dream. Genesis 41 15. It is dreaming, not praying. Life and wholeheartedness characterize a duty and give it a name. Consider in what need we stand of those things which we ask in prayer. We come to ask the favor of God, and if we do not have his love, all we enjoy is cursed to us. We pray that our souls may be washed in Christ's blood. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. John 13, 8. When will we be sincere and impassioned if not when we are praying for the life of our souls? And it is only fervent prayer if it has the promise of mercy attached to it. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29.13. Prayer is dead without a promise, and the promise is made only to fervency. God's heart is always open to fervent prayer. 4. Prayer must be sincere. Sincerity is the silver thread that must run through all the duties of the Christian religion. Sincerity in prayer is when we have gracious holy intent, when our prayer is not so much for material mercies as for spiritual. We send out prayer as our merchant ship, that we might have large returns of spiritual blessings. Our goal in it is that our hearts will be more holy, that we will have more communion with God, and that we may increase our supply of grace. The prayer that lacks a good purpose 
lacks a good outcome. 5. The prayer that will prevail with God must have a steadfastness of mind. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. Psalm 57, 7. Since the fall, the mind has been like mercury, which will not remain fixed. It has a principle of restlessness and not of peace. The thoughts will be wandering and dancing up and down in prayer, just as if someone who is traveling to a certain place wanders off the road and loses his way. In prayer, we are traveling to the throne of grace. But how often do we, by purposeless thoughts, wander off the road? This is more like wandering than praying. How can we cure unproductive, irrelevant thoughts that distract us in prayer and, we fear, hinder its acceptance? Be very aware in prayer of the infiniteness of God's majesty and purity. His eye is upon us in prayer, and we may say, as David, You have taken account of my wanderings. Psalm 56, 8. Thinking about these things should make us concerned about the duty at hand. If someone were to deliver a request to an earthly king, would he at the same time be playing with a feather? Set yourselves, when you pray, as in God's presence. If you could just look through the keyhole of heaven and see how devout and intent the angels are as they worship God, you would certainly be ashamed at your foolish and irrelevant thoughts and your shameful disrespect in prayer. If you want to keep your mind focused in prayer, you must keep your eye focused on God. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Psalm 123, 1. Much that does not benefit enters in at the eye. When the eye wanders in prayer, the heart wanders. To think that you can keep the heart focused in prayer while letting your eye wander is as if one would think that he can keep his house safe while leaving the windows open. If you want your thoughts to be focused in prayer, get more love to God. Love helps us focus our thoughts. He who is in love cannot keep his thoughts off the object of the love. He who loves the world has his thoughts upon the world. If we loved God more, our minds would be more intent upon him in prayer. If we had more delight in duty, we would have less distraction. Earnestly plead for the help of God's Spirit to focus your minds and make them intent and serious in prayer. The ship without a pilot floats rather than sails. We need the Blessed Spirit to be our pilot to steer us so that our thoughts do not float up and down in prayer. Only God's Spirit can confine the thoughts. It is as difficult for a shaking hand to draw a straight line as it is for us to keep our hearts focused in prayer without the Spirit of God. Make holy thoughts your usual, common thoughts in your ordinary course of life. David often had his thoughts on God. When I awake, I am still with you. Psalm 139, 18. He who gives himself liberty to have foolish and empty thoughts outside of prayer will scarcely have serious thoughts in prayer. If you want to keep your mind focused on God, watch your hearts, not only after prayer, but in prayer. The heart will be prone to wander and to have a thousand different notions in prayer. We read of angels ascending and descending on Jacob's ladder, Genesis 28, 12, and in prayer you will find your hearts ascending to heaven and then in a moment descending upon earthly objects. O oh, Christians, watch your hearts in prayer! What a shame it is to think that when we are speaking to God, our hearts would be in the fields, or in our businesses, or anywhere else, running upon the devil's errand. Strive for larger degrees of grace. 
The more ballast the ship has, the better it sails, and the more grace the heart has, the steadier it will sail to heaven in prayer. 6. Prayer that is likely to prevail with God must contain good argument and reason. God loves to have us plead with Him and to use arguments in prayer. This does not mean to argue, but to use reason and logic from His Word. See how many arguments Jacob used in prayer. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother. Genesis 32, 11. The arguments he used are from God's command, You said to me, Return to your country and to your relatives. Genesis 32, 9. It is as if he had said, It was not my idea to take this journey, but I took it by your direction. Therefore, you must in honor protect me. Jacob uses another argument, too. You said, I will surely prosper you. Genesis 32, 12. Lord, will you go back from your own promise? Thus Jacob was argumentative in prayer, and he not only got a new blessing, but he received a new name. Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Genesis 32, 28. God loves when we use strength of argument, especially when we use His Word. Thus, when we come to God in prayer for grace, let us use logic and reason. Lord, You call Yourself the God of all grace, and where should we go with our jar but to the fountain? Lord, Your grace can be imparted, yet not diminished. Has not Christ purchased grace for poor, needy creatures? Every grain of grace costs a drop of blood. Will Christ die to purchase grace for us, and will we not have the fruit of His purchase? Lord, it is Your delight to give us Your mercy and grace, and will You cut Yourself off from Your own delight? You have promised to give Your Spirit to implant grace. Can truth lie? Can faithfulness deceive? God loves to hear us use reason in prayer based upon His Word. And 7. Prayer that prevails with God must be joined with holiness of life. If you would direct your heart right and spread out your hand to Him, if iniquity is in your hand, put it far away, and do not let wickedness dwell in your tents. Job 11, 13-14 Sin lived in makes the heart hard and makes God's ear deaf. It is foolish to pray against sin and then to sin against prayer. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Psalm 66, 18 Prayer loses its virtue when it is polluted with sin. The incense of prayer must be offered upon the altar of a holy heart. Thus, you see what type of prayer is most likely to prevail with God. Application 1 It reproves those who do not pray at all. It is a characteristic of reprobates that they do not call upon God. Do all the workers of wickedness not know, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? Psalm 14, 4 do they think they will receive charity if they never ask for it? Do they think they will receive mercy from God if they never seek it? Do they think that God would sustain them more than He sustained His own Son? Jesus offered up prayers with strong cries. Hebrews 5 7. None of God's children are born again without the ability to cry unto Him. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6. It reproves those who have stopped praying. To neglect prayer is a sign that they never felt the fruit and comfort of prayer. He who stops praying has stopped fearing and respecting God. 
Indeed, you do away with reverence and hinder meditation before God. Job 15.4. A person who has stopped praying is ready for any wickedness. When Saul had stopped inquiring after God, he went to the witch of Endor. 1 Samuel 28. Application 2. Be people given to prayer. David said that he gave himself to prayer. Psalm 109, 4. Pray for pardon and purity. Prayer is the golden key that opens heaven. The tree of the promise will not drop its fruit unless it is shaken by the hand of prayer. All the benefits of Christ's redemption are handed over to us by prayer. Some might say that they have prayed a long time for mercy and have received no answer. I am weary with my crying, my throat is parched, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. Psalm 69, 3. God hears us even when we do not hear from Him. As soon as prayer is made, God hears it, even though He may not immediately answer. A friend might receive our letter even though he does not quickly send us an answer. God might delay prayer, but he will not deny it. Why might God sometimes delay an answer to prayer? God might delay an answer to prayer because he loves to hear the voice of prayer. The prayer of the upright is his delight. Proverbs 15:8 You let the musician play a great while before you throw him money because you love to hear his music. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet. Song of Solomon 2.14 God might delay an answer to prayer when He will not deny it so that He can humble us. He has spoken much to us in His Word about the need to leave our sins, but we would not hear Him. Therefore. He lets us speak to him in prayer and seems not to hear us. Just as he called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 7.13. God might delay an answer to prayer when he will not deny it because he sees we are not yet ready for the mercy we ask. Maybe we pray for deliverance when we are not ready for it. Our filth still remains. We want God to be swift to deliver us, yet we are slow to repent. God may delay an answer to prayer so that we will more greatly value the mercy we pray for, and so it will be sweeter to us when it comes. The longer the merchant's ships stay abroad, the more the merchant rejoices when they come home loaded with spices and jewels. Therefore, Do not be discouraged, but follow God with prayer. Though God delays, He will not deny. Prayer conquers the invincible. It moves the omnipotent. Yes, He wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought His favor. He found Him at Bethel. Hosea 12, 4 The Syrians tied their god Hercules securely with a golden chain so that he could not move. The Lord was held by Moses' prayer as with a golden chain. Let me alone. Exodus 32, 10. What did Moses do? He simply prayed. Prayer ushers in mercy. No matter how sad and difficult your situation might be, if you can only pray, you don't need to fear. O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. Psalm 10, 17. Therefore, give yourself to prayer. Thomas Watson, A Brief Biography Thomas Watson, circa 1620-1686, was an English nonconformist Puritan pastor and author. He earned his Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts degrees from Emmanuel College, Cambridge. 
In 1646, Watson was employed at St. Stephen Walbrook Church in London, where he remained for the next sixteen years. Thomas married Abigail Beadle in about 1647, and they had at least seven children, although four of the children died when young. During the English Civil War, 1642-1649, Watson leaned toward Presbyterian views, and he sided with the Presbyterians in opposition to the death of King Charles I. Watson was imprisoned in 1651 for his part in a plot to bring back Charles II. In 1652, Watson was released from prison and returned to his duties at St. Stephen Walbrook Church. After the Act of Uniformity was passed in 1662, Watson, a nonconformist, could no longer preach there, although he continued preaching in private when he was able. After the Declaration of Indulgence was passed in 1672, Thomas Watson was able to obtain a license to preach at Crosby Hall in London. He continued preaching there until his health began to decline. He then retired to Barnston in Essex, where he died in 1686 while praying. Thomas Watson's notable writings include The Godly Man's Picture, The Ten Commandments, Heaven Taken by Storm, the Doctrine of Repentance, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and the Body of Divinity. Thomas Watson lived his life for God, and he fit his own definition of a true Christian. Watson wrote that a true Christian carries Christ in his heart and the cross on his shoulders. Watson had his share of difficulty and sorrow yet he remained a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He believed what he preached and wrote, and he lived what he believed. Soon the battle will be over. It will not be long before the day will come when Satan will no longer trouble us. There will be no more deception, temptation, accusation, or confrontation. Our warfare will be over, and our commander, Jesus Christ, will call us away from the battlefield to receive the victor's crown. Thomas Watson This has been The Ten Commandments, Life Application of the Ten Commandments, with additional chapters on sin, salvation, prayer, and more, updated edition, written by Thomas Watson, narrated by Scython Williams, copyright 2020 by Aneco Press, Production copyright 2020 by Aneco Press.